When young men rebel against the authority of their elders to establish their own community in the wild, their venture is bound to fail if there are no women. This was exactly the situation around 750 BC founded the new city of Rome. Perhaps they were ne'er-do-wells fleeing from strict judges or land-hungry farmers in search of new soil. Maybe the city council of Alba Longa had sent them as scouts to monitor the borders toward Tuscany, where a new, mysterious people had just landed. The Etruscans, of whom no one knew where they came from or what they intended. And perhaps among these young wild men were indeed two brothers named Romulus and Remus. In any case, for this settlement to endure, children had to be born. To curb the men's discontent, women were needed. If Romulus was the leader of this wild band of emigrants, then he probably came up with the grand idea to host a great festival and invite the neighboring people, the Sabines, with their king Titus Tatius, but most importantly their daughters. The invitation was gratefully accepted, but while the guests indulged in the games and reveled in their victories, the less athletic hosts abducted the guests' daughters and then drove the Sabines out of the city gates. An outrage. People were very sensitive about such matters back then. Not too long before, a spectacular abduction of a woman had sparked a ten-year war and led to the destruction of the flourishing city of Troy. And the audacious Romans, basically clumsy farm boys, had not just abducted a single woman, but seized several dozen at once. Understandably, the next morning, their fathers and brothers appeared at the city gates. The Romans, knowing their neighbors wouldn't let this nasty prank slide, had fortified themselves on a hill, the capital, in anticipation of an attack. However, they made the imprudent mistake of entrusting the key to their improvised fortress to one of the freshly captured ladies, who was less than thrilled with her imposed husband. The name of this dissatisfied woman has been passed down to us, Tarpeia. She unlocked the gate and let the besiegers in. However, the fathers and brothers were either outraged by this betrayal or didn't want their sisters and daughters back home. In any case, they crushed Tarpeia under their shields and preferred to celebrate a lavish wedding feast with the Romans rather than bash each other's skulls in, especially since the abducted Sabine women declared they had no desire to become widows, so soon should their fathers and brothers win the fight. By the way, the Romans named the rock from which traitors were later thrown to their deaths after the woman who had almost destroyed them. Romulus and Remus, Founding Brothers A word must also be said about his twin brother Remus. The twins were fathered by Mars, the god of war, who during a rare pause from waging war impregnated the sleeping priestess Rhea Silvia. She is said to have placed the infants on a tiny raft and entrusted their lives to the waves of the Tiber River. But instead of drifting out to sea, the raft washed ashore and the pitiful crying of the twins supposedly summoned a she-wolf who suckled them. Some skeptics claim that the she-wolf was actually a farmer's wife named Aka Laurentia, who was called the she-wolf because of her loose morals. But the animal version became the state legend, and it certainly sounds much more exciting. In any case, the twins grew up and were named Romulus and Remus. At the spot where their raft had landed, they founded the city of Rome with friends from Alba Longa. They hitched a white bull and a white mare to a plough and drew a deep furrow around their land, erected a wall, and swore to kill anyone who dared to destroy it. Remus, the pessimist of the two, claimed the wall was useless and, unfortunately, kicked a few stones loose with his foot. In response, Romulus killed him. This is said to have happened on April 21st, 753 BC. That's why, on the day of fratricide, we still celebrate the birthday of the city of Rome. In a few centuries, the modest patch of earth that Romulus and Remus had ploughed with the bull and the white mare became the centre of Latium, the centre of Italy, and later even the centre of the entire known world.
the mighty Etruscans. Quite unlike today's Romans, for whom life seems to be a never-ending game, the ancients took life seriously, and they had reason to. When they set their minds on destroying an enemy, they didn't just declare war and then fight a battle sometime later. They aimed for total destruction, leaving not one stone upon another when they managed to invade enemy cities. The Romans were particularly unforgiving toward the Etruscans, a people who had occupied all of Umbria and Tuscany, were technically far more advanced and were relentlessly pushing southward. It became a long, merciless war, and only a few of the vanquished survived to mourn the downfall of their people. Rarely did a nation disappear so completely from the world stage, perhaps with the exception of Carthage, as did the Etruscans, and rarely have victors so thoroughly eradicated the last traces of their opponents as did the Romans. No one can say with certainty where the Etruscans came from. Some say their facial features resembled tribes from Asia Minor. It is certain that they were the first inhabitants of Italy to possess a fleet, and that the sea along the Tuscan coast is named after them. Their culture was superior to that of the Romans. They were knowledgeable in dental surgery, processed iron into steel, and already used copper, tin, and amber. Their cities, Tarquinia, Orvieto, Perugia, and Vei, were much more modern and beautiful than the primitive villages of the Latins, Sabines, and other tribes of the peninsula. They already had fortifications, proper roads, and importantly, sewers. They were organized, while other tribes left everything to chance. Above all, the Etruscans were characterized by a strong commercial sense that made them willing to make any sacrifice and brave any danger. At a time when the Romans didn't know what was happening beyond the next hill, the Etruscans had already advanced to Piedmont and Lombardy, crossed the Alps, and traveled up the Rhone and the Rhine to bring their goods to Gaul, Switzerland and Germania. While in Rome, sheep still served as currency, the Etruscans were already familiar with coins. They were apparently a cheerful people, the Etruscans. Perhaps that is why they later lost the war against the melancholic Romans, whose lives seemed to consist only of strict duty. On the vases, the Romans forgot to destroy. We see well-dressed men draped in garments that the Romans later chose as their national attire. They wore long, well-kept hair and beards and beautiful jewellery on their wrists, necks and fingers. They knew dance and sport. The men played polo and loved bullfighting. The women played significant social roles. We see them adorned with gold and precious stones, made up, lying on broad couches beside their husbands, smiling as they watched games, or playing the flute themselves. At that time, the Romans were great moralists, and labelled all women with somewhat freer lifestyles as Tuscan women, meaning Etruscan women. The religion of the Etruscans was embodied in a god named Tinia, who wielded his power with lightning and thunder. He did not rule humans directly, but entrusted his commands to a kind of executive committee of twelve great gods, who were so exalted that it was sacrilege even to utter their names. All the gods together formed the great court of the afterlife, where the genii, the souls of the deceased, went as soon as they left their bodily shells. Then a real trial began. Whoever could not prove that they had always lived according to the will of the gods was sent to hell, unless relatives and friends managed, through prayers and sacrifices, to appease the gods. In that case, the condemned would enter paradise, where they could indulge in all worldly pleasures, not much different from those of our days. The Etruscans therefore had no scruples about offering human sacrifices for the salvation of souls. It was almost convenient to use prisoners of war for this purpose. Once, three hundred Roman soldiers captured in battle were stoned to read the future from their still steaming livers. Bulls and sheep were also sacrificed to interpret fate, a custom later adopted by the Romans. A mighty and intelligent people stood against the Romans, but the scattered Etruscan cities never succeeded in uniting, and none was strong enough to subjugate the others. 
the twelve small states allowed themselves to be defeated individually instead of uniting against the common Roman enemy. But let's stay with the chronology of events. The successor of Romulus and the second king of Rome was Numa Pompilius, whom legend portrays half as a saint, half as a philosopher. He accomplished a great political feat by introducing a hierarchy for the many gods brought to Rome by various peoples, which later allowed his successors, Tullus Hostilius and Ancus Marcius, to lead a united people against rival cities. He was probably a high priest as king, for power lay in the hands of the people. Rome was divided into three tribes, the Latins, the Sabines, and after successfully subjugating the Etruscans, a third group. Each tribe was further divided into ten curiae or districts, and each of these into ten gentes or clans. The curiae met twice a year in the curiate assembly, and it was their people's assembly that elected a new king when the old one died. Everyone had equal voting rights, and the majority decided. The king was merely the executor. As long as Rome was a small village, this democracy without class distinctions functioned ideally. But the population grew and needs increased. Soon, the king had no time for all these tasks and began appointing the first officials, the birth of bureaucracy. As more aides took care of streets, the census, land taxes and hygiene, the first ministry soon emerged, the Senate, a council of elders. It consisted of about 100 citizens who initially only advised the king but became increasingly influential over time. Eventually, a standing army was formed, also divided according to the 30 curiae, each providing a centuria, a company of 100 men, and a decuria, 10 horsemen. These 30 companies and 30 decuries together formed a legion, the first and only army corps of ancient Rome. The king, as the supreme commander, had power over the lives and deaths of his soldiers. However, he did not exercise this military power absolutely and unchecked. He led campaigns, but not without first consulting the soldiers' council, to which he also presented the list of officers to be appointed, then called praetors. The old Romans, cunning like farmers, had taken all precautions to prevent their king from turning into a tyrant. He was and remained a delegate of the people. The wise Numa was followed by Tullus Hostilius, who had a much more lively temperament. Politics, adventure and desire were in his blood. After forty years of peace, he longed for victory and loot. Under a pretext, he attacked the city of Alba Longa, from which, according to legend, their ancestors came and he destroyed it. This conquest must have whetted their appetite for more. First under Tullus Hostilius, and later under Ancus Marcius, the Romans started conflicts with all their neighbours. By the time Tarquinius Priscus ascended the throne as the fifth king, Rome had become enemy number one in the entire region, stretching from today's Civita Vecchia in the north to Frascati in the east and Frosinone in the south. Up until the fourth king, farmers were the majority in Rome, so the economy was predominantly agricultural. The 3,300 soldiers that made up the standing army show us that the population comprised about 30,000 people, most of whom lived in the countryside, with just under half in the city. They lived in clay huts, built arbitrarily and scattered, with a single entrance but no windows, consisting of one large room where all inhabitants lived, ate, cooked and slept together, side by side with chickens, donkeys and pigs. In the morning, the men descended into the valley to till the fields, senators like everyone else. Hygiene and personal care were kept to a minimum among women as well. No beauty products, no vanity, little water that had to be laboriously hauled up from the valley. Toilets and sewers were unknown, beards and hair grew unkempt. As for clothing, one shouldn't rely on monuments from much later times. Before they learned to appreciate the toga from the Etruscans, the Romans wore a kind of sleeveless shirt with a hole through which the head was stuck. 
Physical pleasures were virtually unknown. The Romans proved that one can conquer the whole world even if one has to make do with a few spoonfuls of barley boiled in water, a few olives, some goat cheese, and on holidays a glass of wine, usually diluted with water anyway. Even the king did not live much differently. Only during the time of the Tarquin dynasty did he receive a special residence, a throne, and royal insignia. Up to Ancus Marcius he had been an equal among equals, who, like everyone else, had ploughed, sown, and harvested his field. He mingled with the people without guards, for otherwise he would have been suspected of ruling his subjects by force rather than with their free consent. Wars were waged by the Romans at that time without special military organization. The praetor, who commanded his centuria or decuria, wore no special insignia. Soldiers used stones, sticks, or very primitive swords as weapons. The first wars that Rome waged under its adventurous kings probably resembled large brawls without tactics or strategy. The defeated enemy became an object that the Roman considered his personal property. If he was in a bad mood, he simply killed him without much ado. If he was in a good mood, he took him home as a slave and had unlimited power over him. The conquered territories were confiscated by the state and leased to subjects, with most cities destroyed. Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, the Ambitious Outsider 150 years after the founding of Rome, a certain Lucius Tarquinius lived in the city, a man who differed greatly from those the Romans had previously chosen as their kings or senators. He hailed from Tarquini and was the son of Demaratus, a Greek immigrant from Corinth and an Etruscan woman. Ambitious, sharp-witted and open-minded, he was rich, elegant, extravagant, and the only one in the city who understood mathematics, philosophy and geography. Politics was in his blood, and in diplomacy and intrigue he towered over his simple-minded fellow citizens. He was the first, later wrote Titus Livius about him, who schemed to become king and gave speeches to secure the support of the plebs. The plebs were a new element in Roman history. The first four Roman kings hadn't needed to court the favour of the lower classes. In the people's assemblies, the curiate assemblies that elected the king, there were no class differences. All were citizens, all owned more or less land, and all had the same voting rights. But after the death of Ancus Marcius, the situation fundamentally changed. The demands of war had developed industry and promoted the Etruscan element of blacksmiths, carpenters and merchants. New craftsmen had immigrated to Rome from Tarquinii, Aretium and V, and the workshops filled with journeymen. Higher wages drew rural workers into the city, and many soldiers preferred to stay in Rome rather than return to their home field after completing their campaigns. But above all, the victorious wars had brought a large number of slaves into the capital, and these mixed people made up the plebs. Lucius Tarquinius and his Etruscan friends soon realized they could benefit from this segment of the population excluded from the citizens' assemblies. However, they had to convince them that only an Etruscan, that is, a foreign king, would protect their rights. Behind Lucius stood those we would today call entrepreneurs or industrialists, people with money who were willing to spend on election propaganda to secure a government that would represent their interests. In comparison, not much has changed today. Somehow these people managed to place Lucius Tarquinius on the throne, who ruled under the name Tarquinius Priscus for 38 years. To finally get rid of him, the patricians, the landowners, had to resort to murder. He was an authoritarian, demagogic and warlike ruler. He built himself a palace in Etruscan style, much more magnificent than the simple Roman royal residence. He sat there with a scepter in hand and a feathered helmet on his head, surrounded by a bodyguard, for he knew how to impress his subjects. Objectively speaking, Rome made a huge leap forward under his rule. The first sewage canals were built, probably also the Forum and the Circus Maximus, and finally proper houses with windows and an atrium. The king had to fight against the Senate all his life, which was unwilling to give up its right of control. 
As this became increasingly troublesome, the Senate decided to eliminate Tarquinius by murder, but the patricians made the unforgivable mistake of leaving his wife and young son alive. Tanaquil, the queen, was Etruscan and had shared not only the marriage bed with her husband, but also the work and government affairs. She was interested in foreign policy, finances, and knew more than many of the senators, among whom there were still illiterates. After burying her husband, she ascended the throne and ruled in the name of her son, Servius Tullius, who was the first and last Roman king to seize the crown without being elected. As his first act, he granted citizenship to the sons of freed slaves and abolished the old division into Curiae. In their place, he introduced five classes into which the entire population, patricians and plebeians, was classified according to their wealth or land ownership. Accordingly, taxes were set and military service was regulated. From now on, economic differences also played a political role. The first class now had 98 votes and the last only one. Altogether, there were 193 votes. Practically, the 98 votes of the first class, the rich, were enough to achieve a majority. It became a capitalist regime that shifted the monopoly of power from the hands of the landowners to those of the industrial magnates, thereby considerably cutting the powers of the Senate, which was composed of less wealthy people. What could the senators do about it? Servius had seized the throne without their approval and relied on the rich to whom he gave new power and on the plebeians to whom he provided work, bread and civil rights. To overthrow the king, the senators won over his nephew. After all, as a close relative, he had free access to the royal palace. But when the young Tarquinius murdered his uncle, the senator's relief was short-lived for the young murderer took the throne without asking for permission. This entire action by the Democrats turned out to be a glorious failure as the young king was far more tyrannical and violent than his predecessor. He spent almost his entire reign on military campaigns. Under him, the Romans not only conquered all of Sabine territory, but also the colonies south of Rome. A conspiracy eventually forced him to flee to the homeland of his ancestors, north to Etruria. The fall of the monarchy and the birth of the Republic In Rome, the Republic was proclaimed. It was the year 508 BC, and 245 years had passed since the city's founding. Like almost all peoples who changed their government, the Romans welcomed the new republic with enthusiasm. Naturally, they were convinced that now all their hopes for freedom and social justice would be fulfilled. Finally, he is overthrown, the miserable tyrant, that cursed assassin who set himself up as ruler over all of us against every right of nature. You have driven him out, that is true, but the king had enough time to take his precious jewellery and splendid garments with him. At last, we will be a free people, subject only to the gods, just as our ancestors intended when they founded Rome. And he will ally himself with his countrymen, those cursed Etruscans, massacre us all, burn our huts, and lead our children into slavery. We are Romans. We fear nothing in the world except the gods. No one may threaten us unpunished. No one may rule over us. We will fight for our freedom to the last drop of blood. And if the Etruscans dare to do us violence and drag us into slavery, a Roman woman knows what to do when her honor is threatened. True Romans shouldn't let it come to that. In place of the king, Two consuls were appointed, Lucius Brutus and Publius Valerius were elected. The latter earned the nickname Publicola, friend of the people, because he had some laws passed that were fundamental for the entire duration of the Republic. They provided the death penalty for anyone who wanted to seize public office without the consent of the people. Furthermore, they established the right of every Roman citizen sentenced to death to appeal to the Curiate Assembly, as well as the right to kill anyone, if necessary even without trial, who attempted to proclaim himself king.
Publius also introduced the custom that the fasces, the bundles of rods, which came back into fashion under Mussolini and were carried before the consul as a symbol of his power when entering the curate assembly, were lowered to symbolically show that this power was conferred by the people. These were all admirable measures that initially made a big impression. But over time, as the first enthusiasm faded, the Romans began to wonder what practical advantage the new system actually had. Indeed, now all citizens had the right to vote, but in the assemblies, voting remained class-based, so that the millionaires of the first class had 98 centuries, that is, 98 votes, sufficient on their own to impose their will on the others. One of the first resolutions of the new republic involved the revocation of the land distribution to the poor that the Tarquins had carried out in the lands they had conquered. Many small landowners now found themselves deprived of their little piece of land and returned to Rome seeking work, but there was little employment for them there. The consuls were elected for only one year and couldn't, in such a short term, plan large public works like the kings appointed for life. The city found itself in a constant crisis and things went very badly for the dispossessed peasants migrating in from outside. However, the propagandists of the new regime didn't tire of bringing the crimes of the kings before the people's eyes. One point on which the propagandists particularly liked to dwell was the alleged attempt by the Tarquins to degrade Rome to a colony of Etruria. But it was precisely from the Etruscans that Rome owed its Circus Maximus, its great sewer, Cloaca Maxima, its engineers and craftsmen, its gladiator games and public entertainments, its walls and canals, and finally also its cult of gods imported from Etruria. The propagandists who agitated against the enemy in the north were ultimately proven right. Soon after Tarquinius's flight, the Etruscans declared war. We don't know exactly how the deposed king managed to persuade the Etruscans to campaign against their dangerous neighbour. But the situation, as the exiled king would have explained to his hosts, was more favourable than ever. Economically, the city was lying low. Internal unrest seemed to paralyse it. Why, so the legend reports were true wonders of heroism performed in this war. Mucius Scaevola sneaked into the enemy camp to assassinate the opposing general Porsena, but missed his target, and to punish himself, voluntarily burned his own hand over a glowing coal basin. Horatius Cocles held off the enemy forces at the Tiber Bridge long enough for his comrades to destroy the bridge behind him, but all this was of no avail. The war was lost. The unconditional surrender of Rome to General Porsena returned all Etruscan territories to him. Thus Rome, which under its kings had been the capital of a small empire, remained master of only a tiny territory. It took almost a century for the future world power to recover from this blow. But first, two treaties were concluded one with Carthage to ensure peace from the seaside, and one with the Latin League. Both required further concessions. However, the treaty with the Carthaginians didn't cost Rome much at the time, as it didn't possess a significant fleet itself. More painful was the concession on land, which had to be signed by the consul Spurius Cassius. Rome remained master of only 500 square miles. The Foedus Cassianum, that famous treaty from the year 493 BC began with the grand words, May there be peace between the Romans and the Latin cities as long as heaven and earth endure. Heaven and earth still existed when hardly a century later the Roman Republic wiped out the cities of the Latin League. The war claimed another victim, Tarquinius, the Roman king in exile. He had been ready to rush back to Rome and give free rein to his thirst for revenge when General Porsena held him back and declared that he had no intention of putting him back on the throne. He probably distrusted the cunning intriguer. Etruria was an anarchic structure of cities that wanted to remain independent and tolerated no restriction of their autonomy. Probably, under the Tarquins, Rome would become an Etruscan city again, but Etruria itself might possibly become a Roman province. 
That was something Porsena, who was not only a general but also a statesman, didn't want. Tarquinius died lonely and embittered in Cumae. The Law of the Twelve Tables and Plebeian Rites Meanwhile, the internal constitution of Rome made an important step forward with the Law of the Twelve Tables. It represented an undeniable success for the plebeians, who had incessantly demanded that the laws no longer remain exclusively in the hands of the priests, a monopoly of the patricians, but be publicly proclaimed. Until then, the laws by which justice was administered had been secret and jealously guarded by the priests. They were even mixed with religious ceremonies through which one sought to learn the will of the gods. Thus it sometimes happened that the gods, if they were in a good mood, let a murderer go free, and if they were displeased, condemned a chicken thief to death. And since those who had to ascertain the will of the gods were exclusively patricians, the plebeians felt unprotected. Under the pressure of external danger from the onslaught of the Volsci and Gauls, and under the threat of emigrating from the city, the Senate relented after long hesitation and sent three of its members to Greece to study the existing laws there. Upon their return, a commission of ten legislators was formed, the so-called Decemviri, under the chairmanship of Appius Claudius. They drafted the laws of the Twelve Tables, which became the source of all Roman law. That was in the year 461 BC, approximately the 300th year after the city's founding. It wasn't yet the final triumph of democracy, which would only come a century later with the Licinian law of equality between plebeians and patricians, but it was a great step forward. King Pyrrhus of Epirus, the Adventurous Commander King Pyrrhus of Epirus, the most famous military leader of his time, was an unusual figure. Perhaps he could have lived long and in peace if he had been content with his small mountainous kingdom, but he had probably read too much about the heroic deeds of Achilles and felt the blood of the great Alexander flowing in his veins. Thus, he became one of those military figures like the condottieri that Italy later produced in the 15th century. Mercenary leaders, filled with a thirst for adventure, who entered the service of foreign lords. He enthusiastically accepted the offer of the inhabitants of Tarentum, who were harassed by Rome. At that time, Tarentum was a large Greek city that, under the rule of Archytas, one of the most significant statesmen of antiquity, had made great progress in industry, trade and art. However, the city did not have a powerful army. So the adventurous king from Greece set sail with his soldiers and confronted the Romans at Heraclea. For the first time, the Romans faced a new and completely unknown weapon. The war elephants and the Greek Macedonian mercenary army in phalanx formation. Pyrrhus won after a bloody battle, but the Roman citizen army had inflicted such losses on him that since that time people speak of a Pyrrhic victory when the victory is purchased too dearly. Once more the commander tried in the next year, 279 BC, at Asculum, but even here his losses were so terrible that he is said to have exclaimed, in view of the battlefield covered with corpses. He sent one of his most capable envoys, Cineas, with 2,000 prisoners to Rome, who, according to his instructions, had to return should the peace negotiations fail. It is said that the Roman Senate was almost ready to accept the terms when the blind old Appius Claudius rose and reminded them of the old Roman custom of not yielding in misfortune and never negotiating with an enemy as long as he had his camp on native soil. Impressed by this pride and moved by the nobility of an intrepid Roman, Gaius Fabricius, who warned him of a poisoning plot by his own physician, Pyrrhus released all Roman prisoners without ransom and left Italy. He sailed to the Greek cities of Sicily, whose offer to free them from the Carthaginians he had accepted. But even there he had no luck. The Greeks who had called him refused him the promised auxiliary troops. Discouraged, he returned to Tarentum, which had meanwhile been attacked by Roman legions. This time the Roman legions were no longer frightened by the elephants, and Pyrrhus was finally defeated by them in 275 BC at Maleventum.
Disappointed, the old warhorse left the Italian peninsula and died a short time later in a ridiculous street fight in Argos. Exactly 70 years had passed since Rome, after overcoming internal crises through the overthrow of the monarchy, had turned to wars of conquest. Rome was now the master of the peninsula from the Tuscan Apennines to the Strait of Sicily. The enemy lands were distributed to poor Roman citizens whose selection was made according to the criterion of military suitability. Mostly, these were proven veterans who were known to defend Rome well. Moreover, during the period of peace after the victory over Pyrrhus, Rome carried out a series of major domestic and administrative improvements which contributed greatly to forming a unified state from the occupied territories. The Via Appia, built by Appius Claudius from Rome to Capua and named after him, a marvel of road construction for that time, was extended to Brundisium and Tarentum. Not only soldiers, but also farmers who colonized the conquered territories and a host of administrative officials who brought Roman law and state order to the occupied areas now traveled over it. At the head of its bureaucracy stood the praetors and judicial officials who administered justice according to Roman custom. Then came the Aediles, responsible for market and street police as well as overseeing public games. Two censors assessed the wealth of citizens, leased state lands, and collected taxes from the subjugated peoples. They also ensured morals and customs. Questors managed the state and war treasury, oversaw expenditures for state buildings, religious services, and the salaries of lower officials. The officials were elected each time for one year, the censors every five years. Those who dedicated themselves to public service first accompanied the quaestor, then the aedile, finally the praetor, and at the end, the consul. According to the law, plebeians were no longer excluded from state offices, and since the office of praetor brought with it membership in the Senate for the holder, at least theoretically, the way was open for them to the last bastion of the patricians. An extraordinary dignity was recognized only to the dictator, who could be elected in times of danger for a maximum of six months, and during this time united the unrestricted highest military and civil power in his person. With this meticulously organized state, Rome set out to conquer the then known world. The Empire of the Carthaginians was founded by the Phoenicians, a people of Semitic race and language like the Jews. Great merchants and seafarers, they sailed with their ships everywhere in the then known world and traded with anyone they met. They were the first seafarers to sail through the Strait of Gibraltar, cruised along the African coast in the Atlantic Ocean and advanced as far as today's Portugal. They established trading posts and places for ship repairs on foreign coasts, leading to the founding of Leptis Magna, Utica, Biserte, and Bona. The Carthaginians also knew much about agriculture. The Romans marveled at the professional cultivation of wine, olives, and fruit. A large part of the country's products was loaded onto ships to be exported to Spain or Greece. Caravans equipped in Carthage crossed the Sahara Desert, discovered gold and ivory, and brought them to their homeland. Carthage already possessed banknotes in the form of leather strips when Rome was still minting its first primitive metal coins. In the Mediterranean, the Carthaginian coin was what the dollar is in the world today. Its nominal value was guaranteed by gold that piled up to the ceiling in Carthage's state treasury. The 200,000 to 300,000 inhabitants did not live in huts like the Romans, but if they belonged to the poorer population, in skyscrapers up to 12 stories high. The rich lived in palaces surrounded by gardens and ponds. Countless were the temples and public baths. The harbour had 220 docks and was adorned with 440 marble columns. Bastions studded with towers surrounded the city like a Maginot line, capable of accommodating up to 20,000 fully equipped soldiers, 4,000 horses and 300 elephants. The rich, dressed in elegant garments trimmed with purple and wore a ring in their nose. The women went veiled and spent their time mostly indoors, but the ecclesiastical career was open to them. 
in which they could attain high positions, prostitution was respected and a thriving trade. The Carthaginians loved to celebrate often and were considered great eaters and drinkers. In times of need, they brought offerings to their gods, usually goats and cows. But to the most important god, Baal Hammon, children were offered, who were placed in the arms of the bronze statue, and from there rolled into the fire lit underneath. Up to three hundred were burned in a day, amid the deafening noise of trumpets and drums, intended to drown out their screams. The mothers had to attend without tears or lamentation. Presumably, it was customary for rich families to buy children from the poor if they had to provide offspring for the sacrifice. As in Rome, the supreme legislative authority was the Senate, consisting of 300 members. At sea, the Carthaginians tolerated no competition. Any foreign ship that came within their reach was mercilessly confiscated or sunk with the entire crew, regardless of where it came from or what nationality it belonged to. It was the greed of the Romans that triggered the First Punic War. Sicily, this flourishing granary in the Mediterranean, was too tempting to leave under Carthaginian influence permanently. The Centuriate Assembly entrusted the task of expelling the Carthaginians from the island to the consul Appius Claudius. In the spring of the year 264 BC, a small Roman fleet sailed through the Strait of Sicily, took Messina, and captured the Carthaginian general Hanno. He was given the choice, retreat or captivity. Hanno did not hesitate for a minute and returned with his small army to his homeland, where he was crucified in gratitude, for Carthage had no intention of tolerating any affront from the Romans. The city sent a new general at the head of fresh troops. They landed in Sicily and initially made contact with the Greeks. They succeeded in forming an alliance first with Agrigentum and then with Syracuse. Appius Claudius, on the other hand, had counted on the centuries-old enmity between Greeks and Phoenicians and found himself and his army caught off guard by this new friendship. He resorted to a ruse. He let it be known that the changed situation forced him to return to Rome to obtain new orders and to make the deception credible. He even had some ships sail north, which the Carthaginians, feeling secure, neglected to monitor the strait. Whereupon Appius, with 20,000 men, landed south of Messina in front of the Syracusan camp and attacked it. Higher on, the commander of Syracuse fought bravely, but the sudden appearance of the Romans made him suspicious. He believed in a betrayal by the Carthaginians and returned angrily to Syracuse. After isolating the Carthaginians in this way, Appius threw himself against them with all his might, but he did not succeed in taking Messina. So he left a small part of his army to besiege the city and hurried with the bulk of his troops after the fleeing Hieron to secure his rear. But Hieron dealt the Romans a severe defeat. Appius survived by the skin of his teeth and had to realize that his enterprise was more difficult than the Senate in Rome had imagined. He left the rest of his troops in front of Messina and sailed back to Rome to request reinforcements. Now diplomacy was needed. It succeeded in bringing Hieron over to Rome's side. That was a success, but not sufficient on its own. Agrigentum was also necessary. But this city was occupied by a strong Carthaginian garrison. Although the Romans besieged it and forced the defenders to a sortie after seven months, in which they were defeated, Carthage immediately sent a new army under the command of General Hamilcar, who chose a new tactic. He avoided battle on land and attacked the Roman sea bases on the coast with his fleet, achieving victory after victory. But now Rome's true strength became apparent. In a few months, a hundred and twenty ships were laid down under incredible efforts and sent against Hamilcar and the arrogance of the Carthaginians, who had never had to fear anyone at sea. But when the enemy fleets met, Hamilcar experienced the surprise of his life. The clumsy Roman ships were equipped with boarding bridges, over which the legionaries stormed onto the enemy ships with their raised short swords and fought as boldly as they were accustomed to on land. 
they thus managed to impose their fighting technique on the opponent, Hamilcar lost a third of his fleet and fled. Carthage was shaken, having considered itself invincible at sea. The Romans, bursting with pride, decided to carry the war across the Mediterranean into the heart of the enemy's country. They built a second fleet of 330 ships with 150,000 crew members and placed it under the command of the consul Attilius Regulus. Carthage armed an equally large naval force and gave command to Hamilcar. The confrontation took place off the coast of Sicily and ended indecisively. The Romans lost 24 ships, the Carthaginians 30, but Regulus was able to land at Clupea on African soil. The decisive battle was fought at Tunis. Of the Roman army, which was utterly defeated, only 2,000 men saved themselves. Regulus himself was captured. It was the year 255 BC. Rome needed five years to recover from this material and moral defeat which had brought the war back to Sicily. In these five years, the fortunes of war fluctuated with slight advantages for the Carthaginians until their new general Hasdrubal was defeated in an attempt to take Panormus and lost 20,000 soldiers. Carthage was now war-weary and sent the prisoner Regulus along with envoys to Rome to make peace proposals. Regulus had to give his word of honour to return to Carthage if the negotiations failed. The Senate asked him to openly express his opinion in the presence of the Carthaginian envoys. Fellow citizens, he said, I tell you Carthage is exhausted. Victory is not far off. Just one more small effort and we have defeated the enemy. Do not consider my life if it concerns the greatness of Rome. Despite the fervent pleas of his wife, Regulus returned to Carthage. There, they were not exactly well disposed toward him and tortured him to death by depriving him of sleep for weeks. But the Roman state coffers were empty and there were hardly any recruits, so the richest citizens financed the construction of a new fleet of 200 ships out of their own pockets and placed it at the disposal of the consul Lutatius Catulus. He blockaded the ports of Drapana and Lilibaeum. The Carthaginians, for their part, sent a fleet of 400 heavily armed ships equipped with all provisions. If they succeeded in landing, it would mean the end of Roman rule in Sicily. Against the explicit orders of the Roman Senate, the severely wounded Catullus nevertheless attacked. The overloaded Carthaginian ships were hindered in their maneuverability. 120 were sunk and the rest scattered in wild flight. The Carthaginian general Hanno, cut off from his homeland, had no choice but to sue for peace. Lutatius immediately accepted the peace offer, granted the enemy an honourable withdrawal and left the determination of further conditions to the Roman Senate. Some Romans reproached Catullus for his excessive leniency, but the Senate was wise enough not to think of continuing the fighting for the time being. It demanded from the Carthaginians the withdrawal from Sicily, the return of prisoners, and the payment of 4,400 talents within ten years. The conditions were surprisingly moderate, and Carthage hastened to accept them. Thus ended the war that had lasted 25 years, from 265 to 241 BC. But Romans and Carthaginians knew that this war had brought no decision, that in the long run there could only be one power in the Mediterranean. Both peoples were exhausted after this war, but the consequences were far worse for Carthage than for Rome. The government of Carthage had refused to pay the soldiers who had served under Hamilcar their wages. When they revolted under the Corporal Matho, they immediately received support from the subjugated tribes, especially the Libyans. They formed a regular army under the command of a Neapolitan slave, Spendius, and besieged the capital. Hamilcar hesitated a long time to take the field against his own soldiers, but when the insurgents buried 700 Carthaginian prisoners alive in front of the city walls and broke the hands and legs of his former colleague Gesco, he decided to act. He called upon the youth of the besieged city to fight, trained them, and attacked the 40,000 besiegers with 10,000 men. 
he broke through the deadly encirclement and drove the opponents into a valley whose both exits he blocked. Here he waited for them to starve. First the encircled consumed their horses, then the prisoners, finally the slaves. At last they sent Spendius and asked for peace. Hamilcar had him crucified. Thereupon the insurgents attempted a breakout and were cut down. Matho was captured and slowly beaten to death. It was, wrote Polybius, one of the bloodiest and cruelest wars in history. During this three-year uprising, Rome had occupied the islands of Sardinia and Corsica. Carthage protested against this. The Romans responded with a declaration of war. Then Carthage, humiliated, accepted the loss of the islands, which became Roman provinces, and agreed to a payment of another 1,200 talents. Hamilcar's Plans and Hannibal's Rise While Rome consolidated its conquests, especially in the north of the peninsula and in southern France, Hamilcar in Carthage pulled out all the stops to prepare for revenge against Rome. After he had bloodily suppressed the mercenary uprising, he tried to persuade the Carthaginian government to entrust him with an army to restore Carthage's former greatness. On his side stood the middle classes, who aimed to regain the lost trade monopoly in the Mediterranean. His idea was to use Spain as an operational base and from there move against the Romans. However, the aristocracy of landowners did not want to embark on a new dangerous adventure. Finally, a compromise was reached. Instead of a large army, Hamilcar was given only a single division, but that was enough for him. After all, he was a capable general. Before he moved against the Romans, he led his son-in-law Hasdrubal and his three young sons, Hannibal, Hasdrubal, and Margo, into the temple and had them swear before the altar of the god Baal Hammon to one day avenge Carthage's power. Then he sailed with them and his troops to Spain. There he needed only a few months to subdue the rebellious cities and recruit soldiers to form a powerful army. Carthage did not support him in this, but the extraordinary man managed it alone. He had iron mined to manufacture weapons for the army and monopolize trade to procure the necessary funds. But he died too early to reap the fruits of his efforts. In a skirmish with a rebellious Iberian tribe, he was fatally struck by an arrow. Dying, he appointed his son-in-law Hasdrubal as his successor. It was a fortunate choice, for Hasdrubal managed the legacy of his father-in-law prudently. Among other things, he is credited with founding the port city of New Carthage, Cartagena, which became the base of Carthaginian power in Spain. When Hasdrubal was killed by the dagger of an assassin, Hamilcar's eldest son Hannibal was proclaimed commander-in-chief by the soldiers. He was then only 25 years old and had spent 17 of those years in the soldiers' camp, yet he never forgot the oath his father had required of him when leaving Carthage. Hannibal was, if perhaps not the greatest general of antiquity, certainly one of the most brilliant. Before his father took him to Spain, he had received, for that time, an excellent education. He spoke Greek and Latin, knew history, and from Hamilcar's tales had formed a fairly accurate picture of Rome's strengths and weaknesses. He was above all convinced that the Romans would be abandoned by their allies if only he could manage to defeat them in their own land, for that is how it had been in his father's time. He completely overlooked, however, that Rome in Italy had almost only allies. Titus Livius tells that Hannibal was frugal, strong, and bold, always the first in battle and the last to return. If he had a fault, it was an excessive confidence in his own improvisational ability. His soldiers idolized him and followed him blindly. Perhaps this was also because he dressed like a simple warrior and shared the army's hardships without complaint. He was not only a master of strategy, but also a shrewd diplomat and a cunning spy. He could not expect his homeland to give him permission for a declaration of war against Rome. The Carthaginians' fear of the mighty and invincible Rome was too great. 
Therefore, Hannibal did everything to force the Romans themselves to declare war. In the year 218 BC, he unexpectedly attacked Saguntum, located south of the Ebro River, which was allied with Rome. That was the beginning of the Second Punic War. The March Over the Alps Never before had a general acted so boldly as Hannibal. He planned to cross the invincible Alps with all the elephants and the entire baggage train. He is leading us to certain death just to satisfy his morbid ambition, some soldiers grumbled. He is leading us to certain victory and will put the insolent Romans in their place once and for all, others retorted. Hannibal spent eight months capturing Saguntum. Then he left his brother Hasdrubal there with orders to prepare reinforcements. He himself crossed the Ebro River with 37 elephants, 50,000 soldiers and 9,000 horsemen which at that time marked the border between the spheres of influence of Rome and Carthage. His army consisted exclusively of Spaniards and North Africans. The difficulties began after crossing the Pyrenees. The Gallic tribes, allied with Marseille, which in turn had treaties with Rome, resisted the advancing troops. Moreover, 3,000 soldiers refused to march further when they heard that Hannibal intended to cross the Alps. The general did not force them and even allowed them to turn back. With the rest of his troops, he crossed the mountains in fifteen days. Several thousand fell victim to the cold, exhaustion, and attacks by mountain tribes. Despair and despondency spread among the soldiers, but Hannibal knew how to lift their spirits repeatedly. He showed them the Po Valley in the distance and spoke of the rich spoils that awaited them. Only 26,000 warriors arrived alive on the other side of the Alps. There, they were warmly welcomed by the subjugated population. Many joined Hannibal. The inhabitants of Cremona and Piacenza rose against the Roman garrisons. The Roman Senate immediately understood that this second war with Carthage was much more dangerous than the first. It called 30,000 soldiers with 14,000 horses to arms and entrusted them to the consul Publius Cornelius Scipio, the first in a long line of generals from the same family. Scipio confronted Hannibal at the Ticinus River and was defeated by the Numidian cavalry. The consul almost lost his life had his 16-year-old son not saved him. This son later avenged his father's defeat in the Battle of Zama. Two months after the defeat at the Ticinus, Rome sent a second army, this time under the consul Tiberius Sempronius, against Hannibal. This one was also defeated. The road to Etruria over the Apennines was thus open. Eight months had passed when another Roman army with 30,000 men, now under the consul Gaius Flaminius, tried once more to stop Hannibal. Flaminius was so sure of his victory that he had brought from Rome the chains in which he wanted to bind Hannibal, but the battle went differently than the bold consul had expected. Hannibal lured the Romans into a cleverly set trap and defeated the enemy in a murderous battle at Lake Trasimene, from which almost no one, including the consul, could escape. In Rome, the praetor Marcus Pomponius tried to calm the spreading panic. Romans, we must now remain calm. We have been defeated in a great battle. The situation is serious. But Hannibal also had problems to contend with. He had to realize that his hopes that Rome's allies would flock to him in droves were not being fulfilled. He was now having difficulty obtaining provisions for his soldiers. In vain, he sent the non-Roman prisoners home. From the Apennines to the Sanio, Italy stood solidly on Rome's side. Therefore, the general decided to advance along the Adriatic coast into the southern part of the peninsula to seek more hospitable regions. His soldiers were exhausted after the three major battles, and Hannibal himself suffered from a painful eye condition that had already cost him the sight in one eye. When the allied Gauls saw that the general was moving further and further away from their regions, they began to desert. Hannibal's Struggles and the Second Punic War
Hannibal sent messengers to Carthage to request help, but in vain. Even his brother Hasdrubal was unable to send reinforcements as the Romans had landed in Spain and were keeping him in check. To make matters worse, a new dangerous opponent had arisen against him in Rome. Quintus Fabius Maximus had been appointed dictator by the Senate and had devised that masterful tactic which earned him the nickname Cunctator, the Delayer. Like a storm cloud, he followed Hannibal's movements but carefully avoided open battle. He waited for difficulties like hunger and exhaustion to wear down his opponent's soldiers and drive them to despair. Unfortunately, the concept didn't quite work out, for the first to be worn down were the Roman legionaries themselves, who increasingly and impatiently demanded battle. Instead of listening to Fabius, they heeded the intriguer, cavalry colonel Minucius Rufus. Fabius was stripped of his command, and in his place stepped the two newly appointed consuls, Lucius Aemilius Paulus and Gaius Terentius Varro. The first was an aristocrat, and fully aware that the Romans were not a match for Hannibal's strategy. The other, Varro, was a plebeian, more patriot than general, who wanted what his voters wanted a quick victory, and since it was about the pride and honour of Rome, he prevailed. Thus he led his 80,000 soldiers and 6,000 riders against Hannibal, who, although he had only 20,000 veterans, 15,000 unreliable Gauls, and 10,000 riders, nevertheless breathed a sigh of relief, for he had feared above all the dangerous strategy of Fabius Maximus. The battle that was now fought was the greatest of antiquity. It took place at Cannae, on the Ophidus River. Hannibal, the old fox, lured the enemy into a plain that facilitated the use of his cavalry. Then he arranged his troops in battle order, with the Gauls in the centre, convinced that they would be the first to flee. And so it happened. Varro pursued them in the heat of battle, while the two outer wings of Hannibal's army closed in around him. Emilius Paulus, who had not wanted the battle, fought bravely and lost his life along with 44,000 other Romans, among whom were 80 senators. Varro, on the other hand, escaped together with that Scipio, who had already saved himself in the battle at the Ticinus River. They fled to Clusium, and from there to Rome. According to later military experts, Cannae remains an unsurpassed example in the history of strategy. Hannibal was the only general who managed to defeat the Romans four times in a row without losing more than 6,000 men, including 4,000 Gauls, but he also lost the secret of his success, which the Romans had now finally discovered, the superiority of his cavalry. At first, it seemed as if Hannibal had finally won. The local population killed the Roman garrisons. Philip V of Macedon concluded an alliance with Hannibal, and Carthage, now delighted over the victories, announced reinforcements. In Rome, some patricians considered fleeing to Greece, but these were only isolated cases of faint-heartedness. The young Scipio, who had escaped from the defeats at the Ticinus and at Cannae, tried with fervent words to encourage his fellow citizens. The noblest brought their jewels and treasuries, the women swept the floors of the temples with their hair, and the government ordered human sacrifices to appease the gods. The soldiers voluntarily renounced their pay, and from the houses of the patricians, thirteen- and fourteen-year-olds volunteered to reinforce the decimated garrison that was to defend Rome in the last battle against Hannibal. But Hannibal did not attack. The proud city lay almost defenceless before him, but he did not strike. An unresolved mystery to this day is why the great general refrained from seizing the sure prize. Whether he was waiting for the promised reinforcements from home, or whether he hoped the enemy would sue for peace, or whether his gods advised him in a dream not to take the last decisive step, whatever the reasons for this hesitation may have been, he decided to rest. He once again sent the non-Roman prisoners back to their homelands and offered the Senate the Roman captives for a small ransom, but the Senate arrogantly refused. So Hannibal had some taken to Carthage as slaves, 
and assigned the rest for gladiator games to entertain his soldiers. After he had come within a few kilometers of Rome, he turned east and moved to Capua. Who knows how world history would have unfolded if Hannibal had decisively marched into Rome. The criticism of one of his officers about this decision has been handed down to us. The gods do not grant all gifts to one man alone. You know how to gain a victory, but not how to use it. Meanwhile, the Romans were in the process of raising a new army of 200,000 men under unspeakable efforts. When it was finally ready, they gave part of the army to the consul Claudius Marcellus so that he could restore order in Sicily, another part to the two Scipios to keep Hasdrubal in check in Spain, and the rest remained to defend the capital in Rome. In the following year, Claudius Marcellus recaptured Syracuse, which had defected during Hannibal's victorious advance and had long resisted the Romans thanks to the ingenuity of the mathematician Archimedes. To this success were added the victories of the two Scipios in Spain, who were able to defeat Hasdrubal multiple times. However, they lost their lives on the battlefield, and ironically, the death of these two brave soldiers would prove to be a stroke of luck for Rome. To replace them, the 24-year-old Publius Cornelius Scipio, son of one and nephew of the other, was sent to Spain. He was that young man who had returned unscathed from the unfortunate battles at the Ticinus and at Cannae. Although he had not yet reached the prescribed age for such a high command, the Senate and the People's Assembly were united and convinced that in such a critical moment, an exception had to be made. Publius Cornelius Scipio was a brave soldier, an excellent cohort leader, and after the defeat at Cannae, the soul of resistance in Rome. He bore an old respected name, was a good orator, just, honest, and devout. He became the saviour of Rome, the hero who would eventually force Carthage to its knees. Indeed, immediately after his arrival in Spain, Publius Cornelius gave proof of his good connections to the gods. To capture New Carthage where the Roman army was camped, the legionaries had to swim across a deep lake connected to the sea, an impossible undertaking for warriors burdened with armour, helmets and weapons. But one morning... Publius Cornelius gathered his soldiers and made them believe that the god Neptune had appeared to him in a dream and promised to lower the water level of the lake. At first, the soldiers were sceptical, but when their general was the first to step into the water, they joyfully followed him, waded enthusiastically through the lake, marvelling at the miracle, and stormed the city. After that, the soldiers whispered that his real father was not Scipio, but Jupiter, in the form of a giant serpent. Of course, there was no miracle involved. Publius Cornelius had merely learned from the fishermen of Tarragona about the tides, of which his peasant soldiers had no idea. Almost all of Spain fell into the hands of the Romans. But Hasdrubal, who now had no reason to stay in Spain, managed to break through with his troops to the north to come to the aid of his brother Hannibal through France and over the Alps. However, his message to his brother fell into the hands of the Romans, who thereby learned of his operational plan. With one army commanded by Claudius Nero, the unsuspecting Hannibal was pinned down in Apulia. The other army, under Livius Salinator, awaited Hasdrubal at a favourable point on the coastal river Metaurus, annihilated the Carthaginian troops, and killed Hannibal's brother. The head is said to have been thrown into Hannibal's camp. The great general felt at the end of his strength. Even Philip of Macedon, after his half-hearted declaration of war, had been turned around by Roman diplomacy and made peace. Of the one hundred ships sent from Carthage with reinforcements, eighty had sunk off the Sardinian coast, and the idleness and rest in the camp at Capua had undermined the morale of the victors of Cannae. In the year 204 BC, after his triumphant return from Spain, Scipio was placed at the head of a new powerful army, which sailed to Africa on a fleet. With that, the war was carried into Carthaginian territory.
Shocked, they hurried to recall Hannibal to defend their city. But the man who now returned home after thirty-six years of absence, almost blind and exhausted from the exertions, was no longer the impetuous young man who had once terrified the Roman Empire. Roman historians report that he had 20,000 rebellious soldiers executed and embarked with the rest in the year 202 BC. He hardly recognized his hometown, which he had left at the age of nine. In the plain of Zama, fifty miles from Carthage, he faced the Romans with his veterans. The strength of the two armies was approximately equal. For months they faced each other idly, only improving their positions. Suddenly, however, the Romans received reinforcements through Massinissa, the king of Numidia, who had just been dethroned by his rival, the Carthage-friendly Syphax. Massinissa had an excellent cavalry, which he made available to Scipio, and it was precisely on the superiority of his cavalry that Hannibal had, as always, pinned his hopes. The battle began under unfavourable conditions for Hannibal. For the first time in his life he had to cede the initiative to his opponent, for Scipio applied the encirclement tactics of his famous enemy. But the 45-year-old Hannibal rediscovered his youthful energy in this threatening situation, attacked Scipio in a personal duel, and wounded him. Then he turned against Massinissa, but even though he repeatedly regrouped his soldiers, it was ultimately all in vain. Twenty thousand of his men covered the battlefield. Hannibal, covered in blood and dust, had to flee back to Carthage. Hardly had he arrived when he convened the Senate and declared that not a battle, but the war was lost, and called for a delegation to be sent to the Romans to ask for peace. And so it happened. Scipio showed himself conciliatory. He demanded the surrender of the Carthaginian fleet except for ten ships, the renunciation of conquests in Europe the recognition of Massinissa as an independent Numidian king and a war indemnity of 10,000 talents, but he left the Carthaginians all their Tunisian and Algerian possessions, merely forbidding them from acquiring new ones. He waived the surrender of Hannibal, whom the Roman people would have liked to see bound in the victor's triumphal procession. Aftermath and the Transformation of Rome this increase in power brought about a profound change in the structure of Roman life. Three hundred thousand dead had remained on the battlefields, among them the best soldiers and farmers. Four hundred cities were destroyed, half of the farms were plundered and desolated, a catastrophe from which especially the South never quite recovered. Two hundred years earlier, the Romans would have overcome this difficult situation in a short time, but their successors were not cut from the same cloth as their forefathers. They felt little desire for backbreaking farm work. International trade and quick money attracted them much more. It was much more convenient to acquire wealth in Spain, where there were productive gold mines and ironworks, than to cultivate the fields with patience and perseverance. The state coffers were filled with the gold of the defeated peoples. Tributes flowed abundantly from the subjugated countries. This economic boom changed the picture of Roman society fundamentally and rendered the rules valid until then obsolete. A new bourgeoisie grew up, merchants and entrepreneurs. What we today call social life emerged, a sort of fashionable class. Faith in the gods became diluted. Rome's virtues, discipline, obedience, frugality, and above all, the unwavering adherence to democracy, were suddenly no longer in demand, and this would later have bitter consequences. The Third and Final Punic War was instigated by Marcus Portius Cato and provoked by Massinissa, one of the most unusual personalities of antiquity. He lived to be ninety years old and fathered his last son at eighty-five. At 88, he still galloped at the head of his troops. After the victory at Zama, he had regained his Numidian throne, and since Carthage, after the peace with Rome, had committed not to fight him, he continually provoked the humiliated city with incursions and raids. 
Carthage protested to Rome, but the victors were deaf to these complaints. When the Carthaginians had paid the last war indemnity, they struck back. At that time, the party of the censor Cato had the upper hand in Rome. He ended all his public speeches with the now famous sentence, Furthermore, I am of the opinion that Carthage must be destroyed. Now driven by Cato, the Senate finally saw a pretext to intervene. The Carthaginians were urged not only to leave Massinissa in peace, but also to provide 300 children from noble Carthaginian families as hostages. Amid the cries of pain from the mothers, some of whom threw themselves into the sea after the Roman ships and drowned, the children were handed over. Shortly thereafter, the Romans demanded additionally all weapons, the entire fleet, and a large part of the grain reserves. These demands, although justified by nothing, were also fulfilled. Then the Romans made the outrageous demand that the entire population leave Carthage and that the city be razed to the ground. In vain did the desperate Carthaginian envoys throw themselves on the ground before the Senate and plead for mercy. Never in history had there been a similarly cruel demand. They reminded the Romans that they had been defeated in bloody wars, that the flower of their youth had been taken to Rome, and that everything of value had been stripped from them. They implored the Romans that if they sought revenge for their actions against King Massinissa, who had robbed them under Roman protection, they should take their lives but spare the innocent population. It was of no use. Rome wanted war and the destruction of Carthage at any price. The Destruction of Carthage When Rome's final harsh demand reached Carthage, the desperate populace turned against their leaders who had handed over their children as hostages, as well as the envoys, ministers and any Italians they could find. They called everyone to arms, including slaves, and transformed every house into a fortress. In just two months of feverish effort, they forged 8,000 shields, 18,000 swords, and 30,000 lances. The siege of the unfortunate city by land and sea lasted three years. Then Scipio Emilianus, son of Emilius Paulus and adoptive grandson of the victor of Zama, was given the dubious honor of invading Carthage. For six days, fierce fighting raged over every street and every house. Scipio ordered the destruction of building after building as the Romans were attacked from every window and rooftop. As the stench of corpses spread over the destroyed city like a foul shroud, only 55,000 of the original 500,000 inhabitants of Carthage remained. Their general, Hasdrubal, fled to Scipio to plead for mercy, and Scipio spared his life. However, Hasdrubal's wife could not bear this disgrace. She threw herself with her children into the flames of a burning house. Scipio, appalled by the massacre, asked the Senate for permission to cease hostilities. But cruel Rome responded that not only should Carthage be destroyed, but all its inhabitants annihilated. The city burned for 17 days. The few survivors were sold into slavery. Carthage vanished from the map. Its territory became the Roman province of Africa. No peace was concluded this time, for there was no one left to negotiate with. The Carthaginian envoys had been right. Never before in history had there been such cruelty. They reminded the Romans of how they had been defeated in bloody wars, how the flower of their youth had been taken to Rome, and how everything of value had been stripped from them. They implored that if the Romans sought revenge for their actions against King Massinissa, who had robbed them under Roman protection, they should take their lives, but spare the innocent population. Cato had achieved his aim, but he did not live to see this triumph. He had died during the siege. Rome after the Punic Wars Rome now had no external enemies, but it was deeply engrossed in internal affairs. The nobility defended their privileges, while the privileged demanded more influence. The Senate postponed an agrarian reform that would have provided land to the dispossessed, 
but did not dare to reintroduce the nobility's monopoly in the courts. The spark that ignited the Great Revolution was the so-called African Scandal in 110 BC. Six years earlier, King Mikipsa of Numidia, son of Masinissa, had died and divided his kingdom among his two sons, Adherbal and Hiempsal, and his illegitimate son, Jugurtha. Jugurtha was a power-hungry man who shrank from no crime. He called upon the Romans for help against his half-brothers. Rome sent an investigative commission which Jugurtha bribed with gifts. Summoned to Rome, he managed through various machinations to delay proceedings and prevent a decisive resolution of the inheritance. Back in Africa, he violated every agreement and treaty. Finally, the consul Metellus received command over the African troops. He was determined to take the field against the usurper and reject any bribery. The Roman populace's hatred against the ever-enriching nobility suddenly flared up when it became known that Metellus opposed the consulship of Gaius Marius simply because he was not of noble birth. Without knowing exactly who he was, the People's Assembly unanimously elected this new man and entrusted him with the legions. Even in ancient Rome, it was said at that time, only a strong man can help here. By chance, they had chosen the right one. Marius was a man of the old stamp, rarely found outside the provinces. The son of a poor day labourer, his university had been the barracks. Covered with scars and medals, he had returned from wars and made a good marriage to a certain Julia, sister of a certain Gaius Julius Caesar, who belonged to the minor nobility, but had a son whose deeds people would talk about for millennia. Thanks to his heroic deeds, Marius had been appointed tribune of the people. However, he did not use this office to engage in politics, which was not his strength anyway, but to return with this new dignity to his soldiers fighting under Metellus in Africa. Metellus looked down haughtily on this upstart and did not take him seriously. Marius, sensitive and resentful, was offended by his general's disdainful attitude and demanded supreme command in the African war for himself. Within a few months, the situation changed dramatically. Jugurtha was defeated and had to ride in the triumphal chariot of the victorious Marius during his entry into Rome, taking a place in the second row. Marius was the hero of the day. Two years later, he was entrusted with supreme command against the Cimbri and Teutons, whom he crushed decisively. Once again, he marched as the saviour of the fatherland in triumph through the streets of Rome. The Rise and Fall of Marius Marius stood at the height of his fame. Five times he had been elected consul, he had reorganized the entire Roman army. He, the peasant, had eliminated the last traces of civil and aristocratic differences in the army. His name was praised everywhere. But then something terrible happened, something completely unexpected, something the peasant Marius had never anticipated. Suddenly there was peace everywhere, no enemy in sight. The victorious general, more akin to a mercenary leader, no longer fit into the circle of well-mannered and perfumed statesmen of Rome. Moreover, he was poor and spoke only Latin. The refined Greek language had always remained foreign to him. He appeared in the Senate in his triumphal costume and was laughed at. Left only with his veterans, he drank heavily with them. Eventually, he opened his fine house to noble guests, wanting to host parties and social gatherings, but no one desired to be a guest of Marius. The splendid halls remained empty, so Marius fervently hoped that the dreadful peace would finally come to an end. In 91 BC, the Italian allies rose against the capital Rome. They had long demanded Roman citizenship, but the conceited Roman populace wanted nothing of it. Now, when initiative was needed, Marius appeared strangely indecisive, 
He waited for the call to go to war, but it never came. In 89 BC, Roman citizenship was granted to all Italians. A new man arose in Rome, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. In 88 BC, Sulla became consul and received supreme command against a dangerous eastern ruler, Mithridates, king of Pontus in northern Asia Minor. Mithridates, presumably of Persian origin, ruled Pontus in what is now Turkey, bordering the Black Sea. The ambitious Marius suddenly found himself overshadowed by Sulla. After all his glorious victories, Marius thought he deserved command against Mithridates. He staged a coup and seized power. When Sulla, suddenly outlawed, returned from Asia Minor, he wandered secretly through Rome's streets. Eventually he went to Marius, and Marius, the good-natured peasant, let him go unharmed. But Sulla gathered an army in southern Italy, marched against Rome, and took the defenceless city without a fight. Now Marius was outlawed. He fled, but was captured by pursuers and brought to prison in chains. Awaiting execution, a slave, a Cimbrian, was sent to kill him. But when the man looked into the flashing eyes of his former conqueror and was shouted at, his hand with the sword trembled. When Roman officials learned that a slave had more reverence for Marius than they did, they were ashamed. They put him on a ship and sent him to the island of Ischia. While Sulla celebrated victory after victory against Mithridates, Marius returned to Rome in 87 BC. He looked terrible, wild, with long hair and beard, his mind filled only with thoughts of revenge. In Rome, the consul Cinna ruled with a heavy hand. A popular uprising drove him out of the city. Cinna allied with Marius and, as avengers, marched back into Rome with an army. Drunk and with glassy eyes, Marius roamed the streets, beheading anyone who did not return his greeting. Feverish and delirious, the man once celebrated as the saviour of the fatherland died. Sulla's Dictatorship Sulla returned from the east after three years, having been declared a public enemy. His property was confiscated, and his relatives were killed. Upon his arrival in Italy, civil war broke out, and entire legions defected to him. Sulla took brutal revenge, executing thousands, including 12,000 Italians, at Preneste. He auctioned off the property of the dead and freed their slaves while lavishing gifts on entertainers and inviting all of Rome to a feast. Sulla made himself dictator for an unlimited time, effectively becoming Rome's first emperor, paving the way for future Caesars. He organized brutal public spectacles where prisoners of war were forced to fight. During one festival, the noblewoman Valeria touched his toga and she later became his fifth wife. Tired of the political games, Sulla eventually abdicated. As he returned home, a bystander insulted him, but he laughed it off, noting that no dictator would ever willingly give up power again. He spent his final years on his estate, hunting and writing memoirs. However, his ruthless nature remained, as he had a man executed for minor disobedience. Sulla died of cancer, masking his pain with humor. His epitaph summed up his life. No friend ever did me a kindness, and no enemy ever did me a wrong that I have not repaid in full. With no external enemies left, Rome became consumed by internal conflicts. The nobility fought to maintain their privileges, while the underprivileged sought more influence. An agrarian reform, aimed at distributing land to the dispossessed, was delayed by the Senate, which feared upsetting the balance of power. Sulla's Rise to Power A new man arose in Rome, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. In 88 BC, Sulla became consul and received supreme command against a dangerous eastern ruler, Mithridates, king of Pontus in northern Asia Minor. Mithridates, presumably of Persian origin, ruled Pontus in what is now Turkey, bordering the Black Sea. The ambitious Marius suddenly found himself overshadowed by Sulla. After all his glorious victories, Marius thought he deserved command against Mithridates. 
He staged a coup and seized power. When Sulla, suddenly outlawed, returned from Asia Minor, he wandered secretly through Rome's streets. Eventually, he went to Marius, and Marius, the good-natured peasant, let him go unharmed. But Sulla gathered an army in southern Italy, marched against Rome, and took the defenceless city without a fight. Now Marius was outlawed. He fled but was captured by pursuers and brought to prison in chains. Awaiting execution, a slave, a Cimbrian, was sent to kill him. But when the man looked into the flashing eyes of his former conqueror and was shouted at, his hand with the sword trembled. When Roman officials learned that a slave had more reverence for Marius than they did, they were ashamed. They put him on a ship and sent him to the island of Ischia. While Sulla celebrated victory after victory against Mithridates, Marius returned to Rome in 87 BC. He looked terrible, wild, with long hair and beard, his mind filled only with thoughts of revenge. In Rome, the consul Cinna ruled with a heavy hand. A popular uprising drove him out of the city. Cinna allied with Marius, and as avengers they marched back into Rome with an army. Drunk and with glassy eyes, Marius roamed the streets, beheading anyone who did not return his greeting. Feverish and delirious, the man once celebrated as the saviour of the fatherland, died. Sulla's Dictatorship Three years after being exiled, Sulla returned from the east, declared a public enemy, his property seized and his relatives killed, Sulla quickly ignited a civil war upon reaching Italy. Entire legions defected to him, and he took brutal revenge, slaughtering thousands, including 12,000 Italians at Preneste. Their property was auctioned, and their slaves freed. He celebrated lavishly, even throwing a grand feast for Rome. Sulla appointed himself dictator, not for six months but indefinitely, becoming Rome's de facto emperor and setting a precedent for future Caesars. He orchestrated bloody public battles and married Valeria, his fifth wife. Tired of political deceit, Sulla voluntarily abdicated. As he returned home, a passerby insulted him, to which Sulla mockingly replied that no dictator would ever willingly relinquish power again. In his final years, he lived peacefully with Valeria, hunting and writing poetry and memoirs, though his cruelty persisted. He had a man strangled for minor disobedience. When Sulla died of cancer, he did so with humour and dictated his epitaph. No friend ever did me a kindness, and no enemy ever did me a wrong that I have not repaid in full. His ruthless legacy left a deep mark on Rome. Life in Rome at that time, 700,000 people lived in Rome, a maze of narrow streets with four- or five-story tenement houses criss the city. The buildings were so close that people could shake hands from window to window. The poorly ventilated houses were breeding grounds for diseases of all kinds. Rents were high. People lived cramped together. But from the temple roof of the capital, the metropolis was beautiful to behold. More and more marble buildings rose from the grey of the alleys. In the temples stood statues that Roman legionaries had looted from around the world. Hundreds of bronze statues, magnificent marble sculptures, especially from the still-admired Greece. Rome had mighty warehouses where salt, grain and wine were stored, as well as large quantities of writing paper from Egypt. If it didn't rain on the Nile and the papyrus harvest was poor, Romans had to write on wax, as the art of paper-making was unknown in ancient Rome. It wasn't until the Arab conquests, almost a thousand years later, that this secret was discovered in the southern Caucasus. During the rainy season, Romans waded through the narrow streets in mud. Under the city walls, the sewers boiled, and no house lacked a latrine. Aqueducts, the famous Roman water conduits, brought 200,000 cubic meters of drinking and bath water into the city daily. Public fountains and bathtubs existed at every street corner. The Gauls had brought trousers to Italy, the Germans fur. Otherwise, all Romans wore the colored tunic. 
Noble citizens wore the white toga over it, sandals and military boots that always left the toes free. Hence, they had to wash their feet several times a day, an almost sacred ceremony. But everything had become a matter of money, much like today. When a murderer was acquitted by a majority of two votes, he slapped his forehead and exclaimed, I must have paid for one vote too many, and that at these high prices. Since everything depended on money, mammon became everyone's sole concern. Of course, there were still honest and conscientious officials in the bureaucracy, but most were incompetent and always ready not only to forego their salary, but even to pay extra if only they could secure a leading position in the provinces. They knew that once there, they would earn a hundred times more. There, they could enrich themselves unbelievably through taxes, selling inhabitants as slaves or even through raids. When Caesar was sent to Spain, he owed his creditors an enormous sum, which he fully repaid within a year after arriving in Spain. Cicero, the famous orator and senator, earned a reputation as an honest man, because as governor of Sicily, he only pocketed 60 million sesterces, as he proudly reported in letters to his friends and acquaintances. The military thought similarly. Lucullus returned from his wars in the east as a billionaire, while Pompey from the same region extracted six to seven billion sesterces for the state treasury and fifteen for himself. It was that easy to make a fortune if one had enough means and influence to buy an office or borrow money from a banker at fifty percent interest. Although the Senate forbade its members this shameless usury, the law was circumvented with the help of straw men. Even a dignified senator like Brutus was involved with shady usurers who managed his fortune and lent his money at the aforementioned scandalous conditions. The enormous decadence in Rome at that time is exemplified by the following episode. One evening, Cicero made fun of Lucullus, the billionaire from the East, whom Sulla had promoted, and who had the reputation of being a great general and refined gourmet. He claimed that all the fame of the bon vivant was just a beautiful farce, and bet that if the society gathered that evening were to visit him unannounced, they would be served nothing but a simple meal that soldiers and peasants ate every evening. Lucullus accepted the challenge and invited everyone to his house. There he had oysters, small birds with asparagus, and crabs served as appetizers. The main course consisted of pork breasts, fish, ducks, hares, turkeys, partridges, peacocks, moray eels, and sturgeon. Of course, cheese, honey-sweetened pastries, and wine were not missing. Surely Pompey was among the feasting guests, for although he came from the bourgeoisie, he was much more cultivated than most aristocrats. Coming from a very wealthy family, he had met Sulla in Athens and was promoted by him. Later he invested his enormous fortune partly in a farm in Epirus, where he bred cattle, partly in Roman rental apartments, a school for gladiators, and a publishing house for books of high cultural value. Pompey was the sword, and now we come to the money, which also had a name, Marcus Licinius Crassus. Crassus means the fat, and he also had the nickname Dives, meaning the rich. So he was the fat, rich Crassus. Crassus, nine years older than Pompey, lacked military skill, but excelled in business and finance. He became the wealthiest man in the Roman Empire, accumulating a fortune of 170 million sesterces through speculation, property deals, and banking. Half of Rome was indebted to him, making him highly influential. In 73 BC, a slave revolt led by Spartacus shook Rome. While Pompey and Crassus effectively ruled the city, Crassus, now Praetor, was given command to suppress the rebellion. After years of fear, he brutally crushed the revolt, lining the roads with 6,000 crucified rebels. Crassus ensured his ally Pompey was elected consul alongside him in 70 BC. Pompey, a brilliant military strategist, extended Rome's territory by defeating King Mithridates and conquering Syria, Palestine, and Armenia. 
Unlike other conquerors, Pompey knew when to stop making the Euphrates the empire's eastern border. However, Pompey's absence from Rome for six years left him vulnerable to envy and internal politics upon his return. Political Turmoil and the Fall of the Roman Republic Amid conspiracy and unrest, Rome's moral decay and widespread debt set the stage for revolution. Secret plots were common as society crumbled from within. In this chaos, Lucius Sergius Catalina, Catiline, thrived. A cunning criminal, Catiline rallied the dissolute youth and debt-ridden men of Rome with a radical agenda, cancelling debts and equal rights for all. After losing his bid for consul, he prepared a conspiracy involving senators, praetors, and slaves. Cicero, the great orator, exposed Catiline's plot. In his famous speech, How long, O Catiline, will you abuse our patience? Cicero revealed the assassination plans and pushed for Catiline's banishment. Catiline fled and raised an army, but in the Battle of Pistoia, he and his conspirators were killed, fighting to the death. Cicero was celebrated as the father of the fatherland for his role in saving the Republic. A wealthy man, he owned estates and villas, growing his fortune through unpaid loans and becoming an heir in numerous wills. Despite this, Cicero's legacy was as a scholar and writer. His surviving speeches and letters shaped Roman Latin, and his thoughts on astronomy were far ahead of his time describing Earth as a small sphere within the vast heavens. However, Cicero's political influence waned as Julius Caesar's power grew. In 43 BC, Cicero became a target of Mark Antony. He was assassinated at age 64, with his head severed by Antony's men. Pompey's Triumph and Decline In the summer of 62 BC, Pompey slowly returned from the east to Italy. This march home with his victorious army was an incredible display of splendor. Upon arriving in Rome, he was celebrated as a conqueror of unprecedented stature. Victory monuments, prisoners, depictions of conquered lands, treasures of unheard of brilliance, five sons and two daughters of the great king Mithridates, the Jewish king Aristobulus, the Armenian prince Tigranes with his wife and daughter, hostages from the Albanians and the king of North Syria, Ulthuses, royal women, goods and men, millions upon millions in mighty chests, all were paraded through the streets of Rome. On tablets carried ahead were the names of the countries and peoples over whom Pompey had triumphed. He had conquered a thousand fortresses and over four hundred cities. He delivered silver and gold vessels of immense value to the public treasury. Pompey, the bold and undefeated general, rode modestly and unassumingly amidst this gigantic triumphal procession. It is said that he wore the 260-year-old cloak of the great Alexander, which the Romans had found among Mithridates' treasures. The people cheered frantically, victors are always celebrated. It was the year 61 BC, but now began Pompey's decline, the confusion and tragedy. He had spent thirty years in the field and now longed for peace and a quiet family life. The Romans began to mock him, giving him offensive nicknames. In this situation, he made a significant mistake. He disbanded his army. Consequently, the Senate refused to ratify his administrative measures in Asia or grant his soldiers the promised land settlements. In his distress, Pompey formed a pact with Julius Caesar. The First Triumvirate and Caesar's Rise At this time, Caesar, 42 years old, was a highly influential politician, a brilliant orator, lawyer and officer from the esteemed patrician family of the Julii, who claimed kings and even gods among their ancestors. To seal this alliance, Pompey married Caesar's only daughter, Julia, 23 years old, beautiful and intelligent. Their marriage lasted only six years. Julia died at 29 in the prime of her youth. Marcus Licinius, Crassus, the capitalist, became the third member of this alliance, a perfect trio. Pompey the soldier, Caesar the politician, Crassus the financier, an unbeatable triumvirate. 
With power now so clearly distributed, Pompey's veterans received the promised lands and his Asian policies were sanctioned. Caesar received the governorship of Illyria and Gaul, a springboard for his future power. While Caesar was conquering Gaul, 58-51 BC, Crassus, a moderately talented general, attempted to conquer Persia. He was captured and cruelly killed by the Persians, who, knowing of his wealth, poured molten gold down his throat. After the death of Julia, Caesar's beloved daughter, the rift between Caesar and Pompey widened. At Pompey's instigation, the Senate ordered Caesar to relinquish his provinces in Gaul and disband his army. Instead, Caesar crossed the Rubicon River, declaring, Alea yacta est, the die is cast, as he chose power over legality. Pompey fled to the east, but was defeated by Caesar at Pharsalus in Thessaly and pursued by him. He tried to seek refuge in Egypt. The Egyptian court, aware of the disaster at Pharsalus, wanted to prevent Pompey from landing. However, the royal chamberlain had a better idea. He sent a general to Pompey's ship, inviting him to the king's court. Because the water was shallow, Pompey boarded an Egyptian boat. As he went ashore, he was treacherously stabbed to death before the eyes of his fifth wife and his son, who had to witness the murder from the ship's deck. It was September 28, 48 BC, the same day Pompey had entered Rome as a triumphant victor thirteen years earlier. Thus ended unworthily the man who had laid the treasures of the world at Rome's feet and was called the Great by his contemporaries. Shortly afterwards, Caesar arrived in Egypt, when he was obsequiously presented with Pompey's severed head. He turned away, deeply shaken, and wept. Friends once said to the dictator Sulla, you have no reason to kill such a young man. Sulla replied that they had little sense if they did not see a threat in this youth, Caesar. Julius Caesar was one of Rome's most distinguished young men from the noble lineage of the Julii, a star in the world's social life. He recited, declaimed, associated with writers, composed poetry, and the pretty girls of Rome bestowed their favors upon him. But this life cost money, a lot of money. Caesar spent so much that he constantly had to borrow to pay his debts. He was reckless, but also clever. Knowing that Sulla sought his life, he roamed the country incognito. When he fell ill, he had himself carried to a different house each night. But Sulla's henchmen found him. He bribed them and fled to Bithynia to King Nicomedes. Soon he was back at sea and was captured by pirates. Caesar laughed at them when they demanded twenty talents as ransom. Far too little, he claimed. He demanded they ask for fifty and threatened that he would crucify them once free. And so it happened. He returned to Rome, was friendly to everyone, and won the people's love and affection. All of Rome talked about the banquets he gave. His reputation in the state grew, and Cicero suspected that Caesar intended to overthrow it. He said, When I see his hair so carefully arranged, when I see that he scratches his head with just one finger, it seems almost as if the overthrow of the Roman constitution could not possibly occur to him. Eventually, Caesar received Spain as governor, later Gaul, and, together with Pompey and Crassus, became one of the most powerful men in Rome. Perhaps Caesar was the most comprehensive genius who ever lived, a consummate statesman, a general who always subordinated his military measures to the grand objectives of politics a writer of extraordinary vividness and simplicity of expression, a born ruler who knew how to captivate everyone. Antony and Cleopatra Pompey's son-in-law and rival was treacherously murdered in Egypt. Caesar landed in Alexandria and played the role of a god. Since he was already there, he decided to settle the affairs of the country before returning to Rome. King Ptolemy, still a boy, was supposed to share the throne with his sister Cleopatra, who was also his wife, according to their father's will. But Cleopatra was in hiding, fearing for her life. Caesar had her secretly summoned. He was enchanted by this woman who, though not classically beautiful, must have possessed immense charisma. 
the perfect diversion for the amorous conqueror after months of abstinent warfare. On the day following his first night with Cleopatra, he settled the dispute between brother and sister and discreetly eliminated the scheming Chancellor Pothinus. Caesar disliked bloodshed, even that of his enemies. However, Alexandria rose in revolt, allying with the Roman garrison against Caesar. The general remained calm, seized the island of Pharos with its famous lighthouse, and waited for reinforcements, which soon arrived and quickly subdued the rebels. Cleopatra had made the right move. She remained loyal to Caesar, while her little brother Ptolemy sided with the rebels. He was never heard from again. The Roman stayed nine months with the beautiful Egyptian, and she bore him a son named Caesarion to dispel any doubts about his paternity. When Caesar returned to Rome with Cleopatra and the baby, his wife Calpurnia did not bat an eye. She was accustomed to her husband's escapades. After settling accounts with his enemies and fighting bloody battles, Caesar had become the absolute ruler of Rome. He was appointed dictator for life. However, through the adulation of flatterers, he became a hated figure, even in the eyes of the good-natured citizens. He had grand plans, but his boundless ambition sowed hatred everywhere. There were even rumors that Caesar intended to move the capital of the empire to Alexandria and marry Cleopatra. The Assassination of Caesar In the streets of Rome, people whispered the latest news about the tyrant. Some claimed Caesar planned to indulge in Babylonian luxuries in Alexandria and make his illegitimate son king of Asia Minor. Others brought worse tidings that he wished to crown himself king, expel the gods from the capital, and install Cleopatra, whose name was spoken with contempt, in their place. The assassination of Caesar on the Ides of March was the logical outcome, a vent for the building pressure. But the all-powerful protective spirit that had always guarded Caesar's life followed him even after death, this time as an avenger. In all lands and on all seas, his murderers were hunted down. The perpetrators all died violent deaths or took their own lives. Brutus, the leader of the conspirators, was defeated by Octavian and Mark Antony at Philippi. He fled to a steep hill and fell upon his sword. The Rise of Octavian and the End of the Republic Fourteen years after Caesar's death began the era of the mighty Caesars, the time of Roman emperors, great autocrats, capricious and often depraved rulers of the world. Mark Antony, Caesar's confidant, and Octavian, his adoptive son, were the first contenders for power. Octavian was only eighteen years old when he learned that Caesar had made him heir to his immense fortune and executor of his political legacy. The young man formed an alliance with Antony, the rough warrior. Octavian controlled Spain, Italy, Africa and Gaul, while Antony was granted governance over the entire East. Everything might have gone well, if not for a woman. Upon arriving in Egypt, Antony summoned Cleopatra to Tarsus to answer accusations of having funded Caesar's assassins. Cleopatra arrived on a ship with purple sails, a gilded prow, and a silver stern. Her crew consisted of maidens dressed as nymphs, standing around a silver seashell in which the Egyptian queen reclined alluringly, dressed as Venus. When Antony reunited with Cleopatra, who had grown into a captivating woman, he quickly fell under her spell. Despite initial accusations against her, by the end of their meeting, Antony had gifted Cleopatra vast territories, including Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Palestine. Enchanted, Antony accompanied her to Alexandria, becoming utterly devoted. Meanwhile, Antony's wife, Fulvia, rebelled against Octavian but died soon after. Cleopatra seized this opportunity, persuading Antony to challenge Octavian. But the soldiers forced a peace agreement, sealed by Antony's marriage to Octavian's sister, Octavia. 
However, Antony soon returned to Cleopatra and sent Octavia back to Rome. He then waged a half-hearted war against the Persians and awarded himself a triumph, angering the Romans. Antony eventually married Cleopatra, giving their children vast territories, including all of Asia Minor. Conflict with Octavian was inevitable. Octavian convinced the Roman Senate that Cleopatra had bewitched Antony, leading to a declaration of war against her. At the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, Antony abandoned his fleet to chase after Cleopatra's fleeing ship, losing the battle and, ultimately, his empire. After the defeat, Antony was left despondent, sitting alone on Cleopatra's ship for three days, heartbroken and humiliated. The Death of Antony and Cleopatra In the summer of 30 BC, Octavian advanced from Syria toward Egypt. Cleopatra and Antony had little to oppose him. Octavian sent his young commander, Thyrsus, to Cleopatra, offering to spare her if she surrendered Antony. Antony, irritable and jealous, had Thyrsus flogged and sent him back to Octavian with a letter. If you are angry that I had your man whipped, you have my freedman Hipparchus there. Hang him up and flog him so we are even. As Octavian marched on Alexandria, Cleopatra had a magnificent mausoleum constructed, transferring her most valuable treasures there. Fearing she would destroy these riches, Octavian sent messages to reassure her. Finally, Octavian stood before the city. Antony made a desperate sally, fighting so bravely that he routed Octavian's cavalry. Proud of his victory, he hurried to tell Cleopatra. He then challenged Octavian to single combat, but Octavian coolly replied, There are many ways to die. Realizing he had no chance, Antony decided he could at least choose his manner of death. When he heard a false report that Cleopatra had taken her own life, he exclaimed, Why delay any longer? Fate has taken away the only pretext for which I wish to live. He ordered his faithful servant Eros to kill him. Eros drew his sword, but turned it upon himself instead. Antony then stabbed himself in the abdomen, but did not die immediately. Hearing that Cleopatra was still alive, he had himself brought to her. She and her attendants hoisted the dying Antony up to her chamber, where he died in her arms. Octavian entered Alexandria and sought to capture Cleopatra alive, intending to display her in his triumphal procession in Rome. Realizing this, Cleopatra resolved to die. She tested various poisons on condemned prisoners and discovered that the bite of the asp caused the least pain and a peaceful death. After bidding farewell at Antony's tomb, she retired to her chamber with two loyal servants. She wrote a letter to Octavian, requesting to be buried beside Antony, and then applied the asp to her arm. She was found dead, adorned in her royal robes lying on a golden bed. Octavian Becomes Augustus Octavian was thirty-one years old and the absolute master of Caesar's legacy. The Senate had neither the will nor the power to challenge him. Cautiously, he did not immediately demand to be named ruler. He knew that the word king was unpopular in Rome. Instead, he presented himself as the restorer of the Republic. In 27 BC, he formally relinquished his powers to the Senate, a shrewd move that only increased his authority. The Senate granted him the title Augustus, meaning the revered one. As Augustus, he ruled with moderation, living in a modest house and working tirelessly as the first servant of the state. He reformed the administration, created efficient bureaucracy, and ushered in an era of peace and prosperity known as the Pax Romana. The Roman Empire reached its zenith under his rule. When the general Publius Quinctilius Varus was defeated by the Germanic chieftain Arminius in the Teutoburg Forest, Augustus was deeply shaken, letting his hair and beard grow in mourning. Augustus died at 76 in Nola near Pompeii, bringing an end to a remarkable era that transformed Rome from a republic into an empire. 
the death of Augustus, and the rise of Tiberius. Augustus worked as usual from 8 a.m. until noon on the day of his death. He summoned his wife Livia, with whom he was soon to celebrate their golden wedding anniversary, and greeted her lovingly. Turning to those around him with a cheerful demeanor, he said, If the people outside are saddened, and I have played my part well, then applaud me as I exit the stage. In Livia's arms, Augustus passed away. The senators carried his bier on their shoulders through Rome before his body was cremated on the field of Mars. They might not have been so sorrowful had they not known that Tiberius would be his successor. Tiberius, Augustus's stepson and successor, was a man devoid of joy, suspicious, gloomy, and discontented with himself and the world. A tragic and somber figure, his character has been difficult for historians to fully grasp. In his rigid and cold nature, combined mistrust and resilience, misanthropy and fear of people, but also intelligence and occasionally even genius. He had no interest in circus games or the sophisticated salons of the metropolis. At 55 years old, Tiberius became emperor after Augustus's death. His first act was to present himself to the Senate and ask to be relieved of his office in favor of restoring the Republic. The Senate regarded this as mere theater and implored him to stay and even name a month after himself, as Augustus had done. Reportedly, Tiberius replied sarcastically, What will you do with my thirteen successors then? With this attitude toward flattery, Tiberius began his reign. By the time of his death, he left behind a flourishing and wealthier state than his predecessor. Perhaps his misfortune was to be depicted unfavorably by historians like Tacitus and Suetonius, who made him the greatest scapegoat of his time. The most significant accusation against him concerns the death of his nephew Germanicus, the son of his beloved brother Drusus and a niece of Mark Antony. Tiberius had adopted Germanicus and designated him as his successor and heir. Handsome, intelligent and courageous, Germanicus was loved by all of Rome. Tiberius sent him as governor to the east to learn to rule but rumors in Rome suggested that Tiberius had removed him out of jealousy. When Germanicus died, whispers arose that he had been killed by a certain Piso on the emperor's orders. Piso took his own life to avoid trial. Agrippina, Germanicus's widow, became Tiberius's most dangerous enemy, while his sister-in-law Antonia, Drusus's widow, and Germanicus's mother always stood by Tiberius's side. Around this time, several conspiracies against the emperor were instigated. Sejanus, the leader of the Praetorian Guard, claimed to have evidence of these plots. Disgusted, Tiberius withdrew to Capri, and Sejanus effectively took control in Rome. One day, Antonia managed to inform Tiberius in a letter that Sejanus planned to overthrow him. Despite his advanced age, Tiberius promptly returned to Rome and took severe action. Sejanus and all his relatives were sentenced to death. After this tragedy, the emperor's mind seemed troubled for another six years. In 37 AD, he left Capri again, and while slowly traveling through Campania toward Rome, he suffered a heart attack. When his attendants saw that he seemed to recover, they smothered him with a pillow. Caligula's reign. Gaius, the second son of Germanicus, was nicknamed Caligula, Little Boot, by the soldiers among whom he grew up in Germany because he wore small military-style boots as a child. Initially, his succession after Tiberius seemed fortunate. Caligula showed compassion for the poor, restored democratic rights to the People's Assembly, and had a reputation as a conscientious and brave soldier. However, his sudden and rapid transformation can only be explained by illness, possibly a personality disorder. It began with him experiencing night terrors, especially during storms. 
He would run screaming through his palace, bordering on insanity. Tall and broad-shouldered, he would sometimes sit for hours in front of a mirror making faces. Suddenly fascinated by Egyptian culture, he demanded that senators kiss his feet and even considered appointing his horse as consul. Caligula's behavior became increasingly erratic and tyrannical. The resolve of the commander of his Praetorian Guard was needed to rid Rome of this menace. The bodyguard assassinated the emperor on his way to the circus. Initially, no one in the city believed Caligula was dead. The frightened citizens thought it might be a ruse to observe their reactions. To prove the tyrant was truly dead, the Praetorians also killed his wife, Sisonia, and his young daughter. Such was the state of Rome that assassination seemed the only alternative to tyranny, and even this had to be carried out by outsiders, as the Romans themselves were no longer capable. The Praetorians, having become masters of the situation after Caligula's death, intended to maintain their control. In searching for a suitable candidate, they found Claudius, Caligula's uncle, then fifty years old, a pitiable figure, stuttering and colourless, who had hidden trembling behind a pillar during the assassination. He was a son of the brilliant Drusus and brother of the beloved Germanicus, and the only one who survived the entire tragedy, partly because he was considered not entirely sane, at least he portrayed himself as such. Claudius had a major weakness, women. He was an incorrigible womanizer. He had three marriages and betrayed all three wives. At fifty, he married his fourth wife, Messalina, then only sixteen years old, who has gone down in history as one of the most notorious empresses, perhaps exaggerated, but at least the most shameless. Messalina openly pursued her desires, and when a young man resisted her, she had Claudius order him to comply, turning intimacy into a patriotic duty. Claudius agreed to everything as long as Messalina allowed him freedom with her attendants. However, when the uninhibited empress one day, in her hubris, married one of her lovers, Silius, it was too much. When ministers whispered to Claudius that Silius intended to overthrow him, the emperor acted. He had Silius executed and Messalina killed. Claudius was deeply saddened and repeatedly asked at his imperial table where Messalina was. As mentioned, he was not always in his right mind. He then married Agrippina, who had a son from her first marriage, Nero. Agrippina was an energetic and ambitious woman who easily dominated the aging, naive emperor. When Claudius eventually sought to understand what was happening behind his back, Agrippina served him a poisoned dish of mushrooms. Later, Nero referred to it as food of the gods, saying his mother had managed to turn a poor fool like Uncle Claudius into a god. Nero, whose name stands for calculated cruelty and vice, became the new emperor. In the first five years of his reign, he appeared as a generous and reasonable ruler, largely thanks to Seneca, who governed in his name. Seneca was a peculiar man who used his influential position to amass wealth, but lived modestly, eating little, drinking only water, and sleeping on a hard bed. He remained faithful to his wife and responded to criticisms of his wealth by saying he praised not the life he led, but the one he ought to lead. As long as Nero listened to Seneca, Rome and the empire remained calm. The borders were secure, trade flourished and crafts developed. But suddenly, at the age of twenty, Nero began to transform into a tyrant. He had his mother Agrippina killed and later his wife Octavia. As with Caligula, such behavior might be explained by madness, possibly due to illness prevalent at the time. Nero, who had shown generosity and mercy for a time, now abandoned himself to an orgy of blood and terror. As the state treasury quickly dissipated due to his extravagance, he forced the condemned to bequeath their fortunes to him. Seneca criticized this decree, leading to his downfall. When Seneca retired to his villa in Campania, he was eventually forced to take his own life on suspicion of conspiracy. 
Without moral restraint, Nero sank deeper into depravity. His ambition was to build a new golden palace that would also serve as a temple. Lacking space in Rome's center, he allegedly had the city set on fire in 64 AD. To find a scapegoat, he blamed a new religious sect, the Christians, followers of Christus, a Jew who had been executed under Pontius Pilate. Some Christians were thrown to wild beasts in the circus, others crucified, and many were burned as living torches. Previously, Romans had paid little attention to them, but after these mass persecutions, they began to regard them with curiosity. Nero fancied himself a great artist and became increasingly bizarre. Disguised, he would sneak into seedy taverns after dusk, assault people, and auction off looted goods in his palace. He ordered executions without trial and extended his meals from noon until midnight, attended by courtesans and dancers. Proudly, he boasted, no prince before me has known what he is allowed to do. For fourteen years, the Roman world endured his rule. On the anniversary of his mother's murder, he learned of a rebellion in Gaul led by Julius Vindex. Realizing his downfall was imminent, Nero reacted passively. When he heard that Spain had also revolted, he fainted. In panic, he planned drastic measures, but lacked the courage to execute them. When informed that the Senate had ordered his execution, he attempted suicide, saying, What an artist dies in me. At thirty-two years old, Nero died. Rome rejoiced at the end of his tyrannical reign. With Nero's death, the lineage of Caesar's descendants came to an end. His successor, Galba, had no familial ties to the infamous emperor. Galba, whom many considered miserly, had proven himself as a governor in Africa and later in Spain. Upon receiving news of Nero's death, he learned that the Roman Senate had sworn allegiance to him. The name Caesar had now become a title for the holder of supreme power. Galba assumed this title in June of 68 AD. However, Galba quickly became unpopular. The gout-stricken, stingy old man never kept his promises. He treated soldiers and officers with disdain and was not sparing in his insults. The first troop to renounce obedience to the emperor was the legion in Upper Germany. Marcus Salvius Otho, the governor of Lusitania, modern-day Portugal, incited them against the disliked ruler. Galba was intercepted by assassins on his way to the capital. Offering his neck to the murderers, he reportedly exclaimed, Strike, if it must be so. Rome had become a cesspool of corruption, a festering wound upon the world. Gluttony, perversion, adultery and cruelty showed their ugly faces everywhere among the seven hills that ruled the world. Emperors like Caligula, Nero, and the peculiar Galba had prepared the mire into which the new emperor, Otho, would sink even deeper. Between 30 and 69 AD, Rome's moral compass reached its lowest point. Otho, a born intriguer, reigned for only 95 days before taking his own life. Soldiers in Germany had pledged allegiance to the general Vitellius, but his rule also lasted only a few months. The year 69 AD became infamously known as the Year of the Four Emperors. During Augustus's time, it was customary to attain high state offices through merit, bravery, and notable deeds. By the time of Claudius, uncovering an assassination plot against the emperor was the best way to advance. Later, it became essential only to win over the troops to claim the imperial purple. On August 24th, 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted, burying the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum under ash and lava. Pompeii, a small agricultural city of 15,000 inhabitants, was engulfed within hours. Its wealthy citizens lived extravagantly, with lavish homes decorated in rich Pompeian red and images of Greek gods. Freedmen often rose to prominence as merchants, craftsmen and managers, surpassing the freeborn population in influence. During the destruction of Pompeii, Emperor Titus, son of Vespasian, ruled Rome. 
Known for his generosity and incorruptibility, Titus organized relief efforts after the disaster and completed the Colosseum in 80 AD with a 100-day festival. He was beloved by the people and the Senate, but ruled for only two years. Titus had also destroyed Jerusalem's Temple of Solomon during the siege of 70 AD, and some believed his death at 42 was divine punishment. Historians speculate that Titus may have regretted an illicit relationship with his brother's wife, Domitia. As he lay dying, his brother Domitian rode into Rome and declared himself the new emperor. Domitian sought to surpass all previous emperors, organizing grand spectacles including gladiator fights, chariot races, and even gladiator battles by torchlight. Despite his opulence, Domitian became increasingly cruel. He executed Vestal virgins for alleged unchastity and is believed to have persecuted Christians, including his cousin Flavius Clemens, who became a martyr. Domitian's military campaigns in Germany, Britain, and along the Danube were only partially successful. Like Nero, he was jealous of his general's accomplishments and recalled them if they gained too much glory, as he did with Agricola, who had advanced into Scotland. Despite his grand ambitions, Domitian's reign was marked by treachery and cruelty. Domitian's reign could not last long. Wherever the emperor appeared, fear and terror prevailed. He was widely despised, and conspirators began plotting his death. He was assassinated by his chamberlain, a man named Stephanus, in 96 AD. Domitian had ruled despotically for 15 years. After his end, his statues were shattered by relieved Romans. The rise of Nerva and Trajan. Domitian's assassins had not allowed their victim time to name a successor. The Senate, which had never officially recognized the emperor's right to appoint their successors, but had always approved their choices in practice, seized the opportunity to elect one of their own. Marcus Coxius Nerva, a jurist who wrote poetry in his spare time, became emperor. He possessed neither the contentiousness of lawyers nor the vanity of poets. Likely, his election was due less to his virtues and more to his age and frail health. He was already 66 and suffered from stomach ailments, suggesting a short reign. Indeed, Nerva sat on the throne for only two years, 96-98 AD, but that was enough to rectify the misdeeds of his predecessor. He recalled exiles, distributed land to the dispossessed, freed the Jews from the burdensome financial tributes imposed by Vespasian and restored order to the financial system. Sensing his end was near, he sought a successor acceptable to the Senate whom he could adopt as his son, having no children of his own. His choice fell on Trajan, a general commanding legions in Germany. Trajan, 48 years old at the time, became emperor by adoption and merit, a new procedure that would be maintained for the next hundred years, ensuring a capable line of rulers for Rome from Nerva to Marcus Aurelius. Trajan made good use of his time constructing public buildings, seaports, a road through the Pontine marshes and many bridges in Germany along the Rhine. Forts and river crossings were built. A road from Mainz through Heidelberg to Baden-Baden was his work. In Africa, he extended trade routes to the desert border. The emperor loved hunting and feasts. He was courteous to senators and walked alone through the streets of Rome, a risky endeavor at the time, as much dubious folk roamed the capital. Behind the splendid facades often lurked bitter poverty. Most people lived in expensive rental apartments, and the primary concern of many Romans was money, yet only about half the population, approximately 400,000 people, actually worked for it. Many were indebted to powerful patrons serving as their clients. The larger a patron's entourage, the greater his prestige, which could be very useful in court. For this traditional following, the patron paid his clients but they had to visit his house early every morning to pay their respects. The second means of subsistence was the emperor's grain dole. 
Some historians see this mass of impoverished citizens as a reason for the later downfall of the empire. When the Romans' workday or begging ended around midday, they indulged in leisure activities, free or so cheap that anyone could afford them. The grandest and most popular spectacles were the imperial baths, the Circus Maximus with its daring chariot races, and the Colosseum. Even the poorest Roman could experience thrills and bloodlust almost for free. However, at night, the metropolis transformed into a city of fear. In countless dark, winding alleys, danger lurked. Shady characters roamed about, seeking goods and lives. The rich had little to fear when returning late from a feast, as a troop of torch-bearing slaves usually preceded them, securing the way. But deadly were the thieves who crept along the paths like hunters in search of prey and did not shy away from murder. In this Rome, Emperor Trajan could move about unmolested and without slaves. Such was the respect he commanded. After six years of peace, Trajan's longing for the life among his soldiers was rekindled. Although he was already sixty years old, he placed himself at the head of his legions to expand the empire's borders to the Indian Ocean. The endeavor was almost successful. After a triumphal march through Mesopotamia, Persia, Syria, and Armenia, he left behind Roman provinces everywhere. He also built a fleet for the Red Sea and regretted only being too old to consider conquering India and the Far East. On the return journey to Rome, he died at the age of 64 in 117 AD. Fate sometimes takes strange paths to achieve what is predetermined in the eternal book of life. Hadrian, one of antiquity's greatest emperors became Trajan's successor, probably because he was the beloved of Empress Plotina, Trajan's wife, and though only by marriage, his aunt. In ancient Rome, such relationships were never an obstacle to love. Hadrian ascended the throne at forty, thanks to Empress Plotina's influence. His first act was to withdraw Roman armies from Persia and Armenia, reversing Trajan's expansionist policies, much to the displeasure of his generals, whom he executed when they resisted. Hadrian was a cultured man, indulging in pleasures and surrounding himself with intellectuals, particularly Greeks. He founded a university to attract renowned scholars. Known for accepting criticism, Hadrian once praised Favorinus for his witty reply, a man with thirty armed legions is always right. His passion for travel took him across the empire, where he reinforced borders, notably constructing Hadrian's Wall in Britain and strengthening the limes in Germany. During his travels, Hadrian's relationship with Antonus, a beautiful Greek youth, sparked rumours. After Antonus's mysterious death in Egypt, Hadrian was devastated and built the city of Antinopolis in his honor. Returning to Rome, Hadrian focused on architecture, rebuilding the Pantheon in the Greek style and constructing his grand villa at Tivoli. As his health declined, Hadrian built his tomb, Castel Sant'Angelo, and appointed two successors, Antoninus Pius and Marcus Aurelius. Antoninus ruled peacefully for 23 years, earning the title Pius for his moral virtue. Before his death at 75, Antoninus passed the symbol of his reign, a golden statue of Fortuna, to Marcus Aurelius, reminding him of life's fleeting nature. Always remember that you may soon be gone. Marcus Aurelius, the Philosopher-Emperor Emperor Marcus Aurelius was a philosopher, thinker, sage, statesman, and great military leader. It is worth examining him more closely. Hadrian had recognized the young Marcus Aurelius's abilities early on, effectively discovering him. Otherwise, Marcus might have become just another official or officer unknown to history. At fifteen, he received the toga virilis, the garment that marked a Roman youth's coming of age. Hadrian immediately arranged his marriage to the daughter of Lucius Saonius Commodus, named Fabia, but the marriage was short-lived. After Hadrian's death, Antoninus Pius took over Marcus's education, 
and annulled the youthful marriage. At 23, Marcus married Antoninus's daughter, a very intelligent and beautiful woman, also named Faustina. In the Tiberian palace on the Palatine Hill, the emperor and his adoptive son lived together, and through conversations with the noble old emperor, Marcus likely learned much. Marcus Aurelius was earnest, uncompromising, and worked tirelessly on his own self-improvement. He lived simply. The most esteemed men of Rome visited him daily in the imperial palace, but not in formal attire or grand staterooms. Instead, he received them plainly dressed in his bedroom. When Emperor Antoninus died, Marcus Aurelius was forty years old. In his wise deliberation, he made Lucius Verus, also adopted by Antoninus, his co-regent. He granted him the title of Augustus and decided to rule entirely equally with him. The frail Marcus Aurelius believed he could not govern the vast empire alone. For the first time, two emperors stood at the helm of the world empire, one in the west, the other in the east, a precursor to the later division of the empire. However, the plan failed. Marcus Aurelius ultimately had to handle the enormous difficulties that arose during his reign alone. Hardly had he ascended the throne when the Persians, Germans, and Britons, emboldened by Antoninus's leniency, began threatening the empire's borders. The emperor sent his co-regent Lucius to the east, but upon reaching Antioch, Lucius became enamoured with a beauty named Panthea and lost interest in campaigning further. She was the Cleopatra of Antioch, and Lucius became a second Mark Antony, without his genius or strategic prowess. Marcus Aurelius responded gently instead of forcefully. He sent General Avidius Cassius into battle against the Persians with a fully developed war plan. Later, Lucius did not hesitate to celebrate a triumphal procession in Rome as the victor, Unfortunately, along with the spoils of the defeated enemy, he brought back a terrible gift, the plague. In Rome alone, 20,000 people died. All of Italy was infected. Villages and towns became desolate. No one tended the fields, and the spectre of famine loomed behind the epidemic. To his subjects, Marcus Aurelius became not just an emperor, but also a caregiver. He scarcely left the hospitals for even an hour. Amid this public disaster, he faced personal tragedy. Faustina, the wife given to him by Antoninus, was as beautiful as she was unfaithful. All of Rome gossiped about her adulterous escapades. Marcus Aurelius never complained. On the contrary, in his meditations, he thanked the gods for giving him such a good and devoted wife. Of the four children from this marriage, one daughter died, and another became the unfortunate wife of Lucius, who performed the only good deed of his marriage by making her a widow when he died of a stroke. Of the twins, only Commodus survived, a handsome, robust boy who drove his tutors to despair because he shirked his studies and had only one passion, the fights in the arena with wild animals and gladiators. It was rumoured in Rome that his biological father was a gladiator, a notion not far-fetched, considering that noble Roman ladies often sought the affections of strong gladiators. Yet Marcus Aurelius, unwavering in his trust, loved this son dearly. During a time of plague and famine, Rome faced another crisis, the Germanic tribes pressing against the empire's borders. Marcus Aurelius, though physically frail, led his legions to defend the empire, surprising many with his leadership. For six years, he fought and defeated the Quadi, Langobards, Marcomanni, and Sarmatians. Despite his success, he reflected on the futility of war in his meditations, written in his simple soldier's tent. During his campaigns, Marcus Aurelius faced a rebellion from Avidius Cassius in Egypt. Cassius was killed before the emperor could confront him, and Marcus Aurelius regretted not having the chance to forgive him. His reign, marked by wisdom and magnanimity, shone as Rome's moral conscience. 
However, Marcus's hopes for a stable succession dimmed as his son Commodus, notorious for his cruelty and love of gladiatorial games, gained influence. After Marcus Aurelius fell ill and died during a campaign in Germania, Commodus ascended to the throne. Instead of continuing his father's military efforts, Commodus hastily made peace with the Germanic tribes, abandoning Rome's victories. He returned to Rome, indulging in gladiatorial combat and shocking the Senate by participating in the games himself. Commodus's reign was marked by excess, heavy drinking, gambling, and maintaining a large harem. His close companion, Marcia, a Christian, used her influence to protect fellow Christians from persecution. Commodus's indulgence in the arena and his abandonment of military campaigns would eventually lead to problems for the Roman Empire. The Reign of Terror and Commodus's Assassination The darkest period of Commodus's reign began when informants warned him of an alleged conspiracy by his aunt Lucilla, the sister of Marcus Aurelius. Without seeking evidence, he had her executed. This was only the beginning of greater massacres orchestrated by his Praetorian prefect Cleander. The population suffered under the brutal actions of these imperial guards. Eventually, the people of Rome, driven more by fear than courage, besieged the imperial palace and demanded Cleander's head. To appease the angry mob, Commodus had Cleander executed and replaced him with Latus, a cunning officer who quickly realized his precarious position. Facing the choice of being killed by the populace to please the emperor, or by the emperor to appease the people, Latus chose a third option. Eliminate the emperor himself. He conspired with Marcia, who administered poison to Commodus. When the poison did not act quickly enough due to Commodus's strong constitution, they resorted to strangling him in his bath on December 31st, 192 AD. The year of the five emperors and the rise of Septimius Severus. Following Commodus's death, Rome descended into chaos. The Senate, relieved, proclaimed Pertinax, one of their own, as the new emperor. Pertinax attempted to restore financial order, implementing austerity measures that angered the Praetorian Guard. After just two months, they assassinated him and announced that the throne would go to the highest bidder. A wealthy senator, Didius Julianus, was persuaded by his ambitious wife and daughter to bid for the throne. He offered each Praetorian 5,000 denarii and was accepted. However, the Senate, though diminished, was appalled by this transaction and secretly appealed to provincial generals. Septimius Severus, commanding legions in Pannonia, marched on Rome, promising double what Julianus had offered. Julianus was executed, and Severus took power. He transformed the empire into a hereditary military monarchy, relying heavily on his soldiers and sidelining the Senate. Upon his death in 211 AD, Severus left the empire to his sons, Caracalla and Geta, advising them to be harmonious, enrich the soldiers, and scorn all others. However, the brothers' rivalry quickly turned deadly. Caracalla lured Geta into a trap and murdered him in their mother's arms. He then ordered the execution of thousands whom he suspected of supporting his brother. Caracalla was intelligent but utterly immoral. He indulged in cruel spectacles, fought wild animals, and even slept among lions. He showed disdain for the Senate but lavished favors on his soldiers, extending Roman citizenship to all free men in the empire a move designed to increase tax revenue. Fascinated by Alexander the Great, Caracalla sought to emulate him, assembling a phalanx and campaigning against the Parthians. However, he neglected his duties as a general, preferring individual combat. His soldiers grew weary of endless battles without spoils, and in 217 AD, Caracalla was assassinated by a soldier named Martialis. After Caracalla's death, his mother Julia Domna, who had lost her sons and husband, committed suicide. Her sister, Julia Mysa, 
sought to restore the family's power through her grandsons. She promoted her 14-year-old grandson, Varius Avitus Bassianus, known as Ilagabalus, claiming he was Caracalla's illegitimate son. Ilagabalus was a priest of the sun god Ilagabal in Emesa, Syria. Brought to Rome, he shocked the populace with his exotic appearance, dressed in silk, adorned with makeup, and wearing jewels. The real power, however, lay with his grandmother, Julia Mysa. Elagabalus indulged in extravagance and attempted to replace the traditional Roman gods with his own deity, even proposing to merge Judaism and Christianity into his sun worship. His behavior alienated the Senate and the army. Julia Mesa, realizing the threat to the dynasty, persuaded him to adopt his cousin Alexander Severus as heir. Eventually, the Praetorian Guard turned against Elagabalus. In 222 AD, he and his mother were assassinated and their bodies were thrown into the Tiber River. Alexander Severus and the Return to Stability Alexander Severus became emperor at 14, guided by his mother, Julia Mamaya. He was diligent, moderate, and sought the counsel of wise advisers. His reign marked a return to more traditional values. He showed tolerance toward Christians and promoted a policy of religious syncretism. However, challenges loomed on the frontiers. When the Persian Empire threatened Rome's eastern borders, Alexander led his troops but sought diplomacy over warfare. Although he achieved some military success, his attempts to buy peace with Germanic tribes were viewed as weakness by his soldiers. Discontented with his leadership, the troops mutinied. In 235 AD, Alexander Severus and his mother were murdered by their own soldiers. This event marked the beginning of the crisis of the 3rd century, a period of military anarchy and frequent changes of emperor. The subsequent 50 years saw numerous emperors, often military leaders, who seized power through force. Notably, Emperor Valerian was captured by the Persians in 260 AD and died in captivity. His son, Gallienus, did little to secure his release and was eventually assassinated. In 270 AD, Lucius Domitius Aurelianus, known as Aurelian, ascended the throne. Recognizing the impossibility of fighting multiple enemies simultaneously, he focused on strengthening the empire's defenses. He ordered the construction of massive walls around Rome and other key cities, a sign of the empire's increasing defensiveness. Aurelian sought to unify the empire religiously by promoting the cult of Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, establishing it as the state religion. This move toward monotheism paved the way for the eventual acceptance of Christianity. Despite his efforts to restore the empire, Aurelian was assassinated by his own officers in 275 AD. His successors, including Tacitus and Probus, continued to struggle with internal instability and external threats. Probus attempted to transform his soldiers into farmers during peacetime, but this policy led to his assassination in 282 AD. The period following Marcus Aurelius's death was marked by political instability, military overreach and economic challenges. The frequent changes in leadership and the reliance on the military to choose emperors weakened the empire. However, leaders like Aurelian made significant efforts to restore stability, setting the stage for future reforms under emperors like Diocletian. The stage was set for Diocletian, the last true Roman emperor. Originally named Diocles, he was the son of a freed Dalmatian slave. His wisdom was evident in his ambition to become the commander of the Praetorian Guard. Recognizing that ascending to the imperial throne required palace intrigue rather than the traditional military or bureaucratic ladder, he orchestrated a conspiracy to seize power. Once emperor, Diocletian made the sensational decision to officially move the capital from Rome to Nicomedia in Asia Minor. 
arguing that Rome was too distant from the empire's troubled frontiers. This move diminished Rome's centrality and marked a significant shift in imperial policy. To manage the vast empire more effectively, Diocletian established the Tetrarchy, a system dividing power among four rulers. He and Maximianus both held the title of Augustus, with Diocletian overseeing the east and Maximianus the west from Milan. Each Augustus appointed a Caesar. Diocletian chose Galerius, stationed in present-day Serbia, while Maximianus selected Constantius Chlorus, who set up his base in Trier, Germany. This system aimed to bring stability, but also signalled Rome's declining influence. Diocletian initiated several reforms, including economic measures like fixing prices and wages to combat inflation. He bound farmers to their land, effectively creating a class of serfs, and compelled workers and craftsmen into guilds they couldn't leave. Goods were collected at central depots, and a strict price control edict was issued in 301 AD. Despite these efforts, the black market thrived, and people evaded his policies, leading to increased governmental control and a proliferation of officials and informants. Persecution of Christians Viewing Christianity as a threat to imperial unity, Diocletian began a severe persecution of Christians two years before his abdication. Officials and military personnel were ordered to sacrifice to the Roman gods. Refusal meant dismissal or execution. Martyrdoms increased significantly, with notable figures like St. Sebastian, St. Agnes, St. Lucia, and St. Catherine among those who suffered. Even members of Diocletian's own household, including his wife Prisca and daughter Valeria, were sympathetic to Christianity. In 305 AD, after 20 years of rule, Diocletian and Maximianus abdicated simultaneously in favor of their Caesars, as they had previously agreed. Diocletian retired to his grand palace in Split, modern-day Croatia, dedicating himself to gardening and reportedly finding great satisfaction in this simple life. When urged to return to politics during subsequent power struggles, he famously declined, emphasizing his contentment away from the throne. Ironically, the Christian faith he had tried to suppress ultimately triumphed. His mausoleum was converted into the Cathedral of St. Domnius in Split, a symbol of Christianity's rise over paganism. Rise of Constantine the Great Flavius Valerius Constantinus, known as Constantine, was the illegitimate son of Constantius Chlorus and his concubine Helena. When Constantius became Caesar, he was pressured to divorce Helena and marry Theodora, Maximianus's daughter. Constantine was educated under his stepmother, but later sent to the court of Galerius effectively as a political hostage. Sensing danger, Constantine escaped and joined his father on a campaign in Britain against the Picts. After Constantius's death in 306 AD, the troops proclaimed Constantine emperor. Although he wisely accepted the lesser title of Caesar initially, conflicts arose as multiple claimants vied for control, including Maxentius in Rome and Licinius in the east. The decisive confrontation occurred on October 27, 312 AD, near the Milvian Bridge, north of Rome. According to Christian historians, Constantine saw a flaming cross in the sky, bearing the words, In hoc signo vinces, in this sign you will conquer. Interpreting this as a divine message, he instructed his soldiers to paint the Christian Chiro symbol on their shields. In the ensuing battle, Constantine's forces defeated Maxentius, who drowned in the Tiber River. This victory was pivotal, marking the first time a Roman emperor embraced Christianity as a tool for unity and power. Embrace of Christianity and Founding of Constantinople In 313 AD, Constantine and Licinius issued the Edict of Milan, granting religious tolerance throughout the empire and restoring confiscated properties to Christians. However, 
Tensions between the two rulers eventually led to conflict. Constantine defeated Licinius in battles at Adrianople and Chrysopolis, becoming the sole ruler of the empire. Constantine founded a new capital, Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, envisioning it as a Christian counterpart to Rome. The city was officially dedicated on May 11, 330 AD. Despite his support for Christianity, Constantine delayed his baptism until shortly before his death in 337 AD, possibly to absolve himself of past sins. Constantine's personal life was marked by tragedy and controversy. He ordered the execution of his eldest son Crispus and his second wife Fausta under mysterious circumstances, possibly due to court intrigues and false accusations. These actions cast a shadow over his legacy. Upon his death, Constantine's empire was divided among his three sons, Constantine II, Constantius II, and Constans, and two nephews. This division led to power struggles and civil wars, weakening the empire's cohesion. Decline of the Western Roman Empire As internal conflicts persisted, external threats intensified. Germanic tribes such as the Goths, Vandals and Huns invaded Roman territories. In 410 AD, the Visigoth king Alaric famously sacked Rome, a shocking event that symbolized the empire's vulnerability. By the mid-5th century, the Western Roman Empire was fragmented. In 476 AD, the Germanic chieftain Odoacer deposed the last emperor, Romulus Augustulus, an event traditionally marking the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire collapsed due to a combination of internal decay, political instability, economic troubles and moral decline and relentless external pressures from invading tribes. While the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantine Empire, continued for nearly a thousand more years, the West plunged into the Dark Ages, a period of cultural and economic deterioration that lasted until the onset of the Middle Ages. The fall of Rome serves as a profound lesson on how great powers can decline when they lose their internal cohesion, moral compass, and ability to adapt to changing circumstances.